Dobro jutro. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Nenad Simović. Good morning. And I'm the country director for Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, before we start, I'd like to check some technical details uh, since we organize a hybrid event. Uh, please confirm, can you hear me and uh, can you hear the tr translators? Is everything okay with that? Okay. It seems that uh, everything is fine. So uh, please allow me to continue this session in local language. Još jedan put dobro jutro. Moje ime je Nenad Simović, ja sam direktor NDI. Once again, good morning. My name is Nenad Simović and I am resident country director for the NDI in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I would like to thank you all for showing the interest in the topic of this conference and for your participation. The conference is um, taking um, place in a very difficult conditions of the pandemic. This is a pandemic that opened doors to autocratic regimes, increased the violations of human rights and also enabled uh, significant corruption, an increase of corruption, especially in the public procurement sector. We are organizing this conference through the USAID uh, program that has been supporting the processes of democratization and the building of democratic institutions of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and I would like to thank them for that. It is important to note that this conference, in addition to our panelists and moderators that we have at the location of the Youth Center in Grbavca, Sarajevo, we have additional 40 participants that have joined us online, and we expect more people to join us uh, uh, well in the future panels, in the panels today. We have uh, representatives of the parliament, representative of the institutions, the state authorities, almost all parliamentary political parties. We have representatives of uh, the US Embassy, Austria, the Netherlands, Sweden and Italy, USAID representatives, as well as representatives of many other local and international organizations, as well as the media representatives. I would like to thank you for your participation. Especially, I would like to thank His Excellency, the United States Ambassador to Bosnia and Herzegovina, Mr. Eric Nelson, who will um, later address us in this introductory part of the conference. The fight against corruption is one of the most important activities in Bosnia and Herzegovina. At today's conference, we will try to take different perspectives to shed light on this fight. I hope that we will have a very interesting exchange of opinions uh, between our panelists who come from politics, institutions, the media, civil society, not only from Bosnia and Herzegovina, but from the entire Western Balkans region, and also to hear from the participants who are in the online audience. Now it is my pleasure to invite His Excellency, the United States Ambassador to Bosnia and Herzegovina, Mr. Alec Nelson, to address us. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Nenad, for your warm introduction. I am happy that I have this opportunity to uh, join this debate uh, on anti-corruption, together with all of you who are working to improve the situation in this field. I want to thank USAID and the National Democratic Institute for supporting anti-corruption efforts and for organizing this event. I would like to greet all participants, members of the state and entity parliaments, academics, civil society organizations, representatives from embassies and international organizations. Your presence here confirms the importance of support for anti-corruption programs. And it confirms your dedication to finding methods for closer collaboration to more effectively combat corruption. Let me also congratulate the Interim Investigative Committee on the Situation in Judicial Institutions of BIH for raising so many important issues during its relatively short mandate and for attracting public attention to their hearings. The U.S. Embassy and USAID are proud to support your efforts. We are convinced that when Parliament members come together from across the political spectrum, it contributes to mutual understanding and meaningful political engagement. The United States stands ready to work with you to ensure that change and reform can be implemented. But you, but you must be committed 
to making the hard choices to fight corruption by adopting good governance reforms. It is a parliament's duty to change or repeal legislation that contains loopholes that can be exploited by corrupt actors. It is also a parliament's duty to pass new legislation that enables remedial measures that will help fight corruption. The investigative committee and other legislative oversight tools provide fundamental checks and balances to hold other branches of government accountable. I hope the committee findings will be used to advance the rule of law and the fight against corruption in BIH. I'm also encouraged by cross-party cooperation within the committee. I believe that real progress can be made only through collaboration and shared decision-making progress process, a shared decision-making across party lines, as opposed to hardline political standoffs and stalemates. I do hope the committee will extend its membership to other parties who have not participated until now. Political parties and countries striving to become successful democracies like Bosnia and Herzegovina must find common ground and common goals. Clear and genuine political commitment is needed to make the fight against corruption a top priority in this country. Immediate results may not be visible, but it's important to persevere on this path. In the long run, effectively combating corruption in, in this country will be rewarding and beneficial to its progress on Euro-Atlantic integration. Corruption involves the betrayal of the trust that citizens place in their elected officials. Anti-corruption measures are most effective when they are integrated into a broader package of institutional reforms. A lack of trust in the electoral process, reduced legitimacy of public institutions, and lack of confidence in public institutions can be both causes and effects of corruption. Building trust in BIH institutions and electoral processes is one of the most important pillars of BIH's democracy. Reliable electoral institutions and local monitoring organizations are essential for the legitimacy of elected representatives, especially in a country like BIH that is still developing trust among institutions, representatives, and citizens. The United States believes that development should help countries become self-reliant. So they transform from needing assistance to becoming prosperous members of the international community. A country so captured by corruption, where the judiciary fails to act on behalf of the people, clearly does not meet that definition. BIH's place on tra Transparency, Interna Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index for 2020 is the lowest since 2012, demonstrating the urgent need to address this problem. The work of the United States in BIH is based on partnership, aimed at bringing the state of BIH to a place where it can function independently and foreign assistance is no longer needed. We call it the journey to self-reliance. The US government wants what its citizens want, a BIH that is safe, stable, prosperous, and self-reliant. We believe this is possible, but it requires people like you to lead the charge and advocate for a more stable political framework. A self-reliant BIH does not espouse hardline separatist policies. It nurtures tolerance and healthy and robust political debate. The former blocks progress. The latter is a foundation for progress and growth for all BIH citizens, regardless of ethnicity, socioeconomic circumstances, or political affiliation. The US remains committed to partnering with BIH institutions 
and citizens in the fight against corruption. Efforts initiated and supported by the people of BIH are the right starting point. The more you advance policies that address the commonalities among all citizens, the more successful Bosnia and Herzegovina will be. I look forward to the day in which EU and NATO membership for Bosnia and Herzegovina is a reality, not just a dream. A future in which rule of law is not an empty phrase, but means that all citizens trust their government to make the right decisions for the country. Radujemo se što imamo priliku sarađivati sa svima babama kako bismo pomogli da se ovo i ostvari. Help in making all of the above possible. Thank you for inviting me to join you at this conference. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador, for your time. And uh, I would like to ask Ms. Marina to present the panel for the first time. Hvala lipa, dobro jutro i dobrodošli. Na početku bih rekla da uruženim snagama... Thank you, good morning and welcome. I think that the joint forces of opposition from both entities in May last year, the ad hoc inquiry committee has been established without any support of SNSD and HDZ. Um, the two topics that they deal with are the judiciary and public procurement. So these will be the topics of this panel, of course, through uh, the lens of corruption. The public hearings that are uh, led by this committee are always very interesting to the public, especially or partly because of the resistance of the institutions to take part in this, but in the other part is due to the witnesses who really openly speak about corruption that is taking place. And we do know that it is taking place. It's very important to say in the very start that the importance of this inquiry committee is very high. This is the first time in the last 20 years that we see such processes taking place. We will be discussing this through the panel in a few minutes. We have the panelists uh, here. You also have the opportunity to ask questions uh, either on Zoom chat or uh, on Facebook. So we will be monitoring uh, both of these sites. Now we will uh, see a short video. do ubistava Davida Dragičevića i Dženana Memića. Sve to stoji u opisu posla privremene istražne komisije. Ja sam Branko Perić, sudio sam suda Bosne i Hercegovine. Jedan sam od prvih sudija koji je govorio pred privremenom istražnom komisijom parlamenta Bosne i Hercegovine. To je bilo prvi put da parlament raspravlja o pravosuđu u poslednjih 20 godina. Bilo je ozbiljnih problema oko toga da li sudije i članove Visokosudskog sudačkog vijeća treba da učestvuju u radu komisije. Ja sam odmah dao nekoliko izjela i rekao sam da je to nužno i da je to potpuno logično. Pravosuđe mora da sarađuje sa zakonodavnom vlašći, jer na drugačiji način nije moguće upravljati pravosudnim sistemom. Tako da sam se pojavio pred istražnom komisijom. Nisam sumnjao da tamo sjede pošteni ljudi kojima je stalo da se problemi u pravosuđu riješi. Oni su imali vrlo korektan odnos. Znali su šta žele, tako da je to bio jedan ozbiljan razgovor. Ljudi koji iskreno žele da rešavaju probleme u pravosuđu. To je ohrabrujuće.
šta god uradi ta komisija, kakav god izvještaj napravi, kako god ga predstavi, to će biti veliki korak. Prosto je bilo nesvatljivo da ne postoji dialog između pravosuđa i zakladavne vlasti. Odnosno, između tri vlasti nužno je da postoji dialog. Dakle, ta izvještaj će biti nekakav ključni ugaoni kamen za budući odnos između pravosuđa i zakladavne vlasti. Tako da bi to trebalo da pomjeri stvari sa mrtve tačke i da ulije povjerenje građanima da vlast u Bosni i Hercegovini, sudska, izvršna i zakonodavna, sarađuju kako bi se sednički problem riješio na najbolji mogući način. Prioritetne teme i za 2021. su nezavisnost pravosuđa, ostanjanje političkog uticaja, zakonska rješenja u borbi protiv korupcije, zakon o Visokom sudskom i tužilačkom savjetu te sukob ingresa. Kao što smo čuli u ovoj priči, kao što smo čuli u ovoj priči, Uh, the introductory video. Judge Perez said, whatever the committee does, it will be a big step forward. So let's hear what will be the focus of the committee's work. We have here the members of the committee. Let me introduce our panelists. We have Damir Arnaud, who's the chairperson of the committee. Alma Cholo, member of the committee. Branislav Borenovic, another member of the committee, and we also have Ivana Korajlić, who is the Executive Director of Transparency International in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Bojan Bajic, who is the President of Business Ethics uh, Committee in the American uh, Chamber of Commerce in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you for your time and thank you for your energy. Don't forget that you can use chat and Q&A to ask questions, please, anything you'd like to know, feel free to ask. Mr. Arnaud, your day is very busy today. After this panel, the members of this committee have two hearings at one o'clock and two o'clock. And at 3.30, you are expecting Zoran Tageltia, the chairperson of the Council of Ministers. Will he appear at the hearing? And what, do the, what are the questions that you plan to ask them? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting us and uh, thank you for uh, to the American Embassy for supporting this committee from the very start. That support was a key element uh, in the very beginning. We needed such support uh, in the circumstances where many people from politics and from the judiciary disputed our right to establish such a committee. Thank you also for organizing this panel and thank you for this unquestionable support that we get uh, in seminars, roundtables, trainings, really. The committee thanks you for that. Today is a typical day. We have hearings. For the first time, we will have a representative of the Council of Ministers, the Minister of Justice, Mr. Grubasha, rejected to come. And uh, Zoran Tageltia said he is coming. And I hope we will see him today at um, 3.30. We will also be speaking with the prosecutors on behalf of the AJPC about the problems in the judiciary. And with Mr. Tageltia, we plan to talk about the fact that he is not submitting uh, to the parliament the laws that will uh, work towards meeting the 14 priorities in our accession process. The three laws, the three new laws, so the new law on public procurement amendments to the AJPC law and the new law on the conflict of interest. These three laws were not received by the parliament from the Council of Ministers, and this is unacceptable. The primary responsibility is lies with the Ministry of Justice because they're drafting the laws, but the Council of Ministers and their chairperson is the person that we need to discuss and really insist to get the answer to the question why these laws never reached the parliament. Other laws as well, but these refer to the judiciary. Yes, do you think that by asking such a question, you can really get the answers that will move things forward? Well, I don't know whether we will get good answers or not. I would not like to speculate on that. But whatever uh, answers we get, and just as Judge says, whatever answers we get, we will learn something. 
if nothing else, we will find out whether we can expect these pieces of legislation in this year, because on one hand, uh, these political leaders are promising citizens uh, certain things, but they are deceiving, uh, you know, public because we will not get the candidate status until these three pieces of legislation are adopted. And it's a quite, um, you know, lengthy road before we adopt piece of of a piece of legislation. So, but again, as I said, you know, these three laws are pretty important for um, on our path to the European Union or, you know, for our candidacy status. Well, obviously, you know, we would like to invite all relevant stakeholders to make sure that really they help us, uh, that we get really our status of candidacy. So you just mentioned the Ministry of Justice who has been actually replaced because of uh, poor results and because of his um, a denial or bef because he hasn't appeared before the commission, you know, and what kind of um, message you try to send with this, you know, because obviously uh, HDZ does not support the work of this commission. Well, this really shows a very, uh, very bad attitude, you know, uh, to the you know, towards the parliament in the country. We are currently in a situation that based on the communication that our services had with the Council of Ministers and their cabinet. We received a proposal for two meetings, but the Minister of Justice failed to appear in any of those meetings. And by this, he conveyed a message that he's not interested at all in cooperating with this committee. And this really shows, um, um, you know, the key role of the ad hoc commission of this kind, because Bosnia and Herzegovina it has been in a transition for decades now, and that's why it is even more important to have ad hoc commissions of this kind. And you will probably hear it during today's discussion. There are many, many reasons, um, or many, um, uh, I would say, many good results that justify the existence of this ad hoc commission. You know, we have provided answers to many questions, you know, and we have also identified a lot of corruption, in particular in the areas that are really particularly painful for, for this country. Later on, I will give you some examples of corruption which are simply beyond belief, even for me. Several times I really asked myself, is this possible? But before we move on, I would like to give you another example of explaining why such commission committees are important. Back in 2018, I was member of a similar committee in Republika Srpska. This was actually a committee to establish uh, the circumstances about the murder of a young man, David Dragicevic. And on that occasion, I realized how powerful the parliamentary committees or bodies are. They are insufficiently used. And you yourself, you said that, that this is the first time in 20 years that uh, one such body inquiry committee has been established within the parliament. In my view, they have made a significant step forward uh, when it comes to establishing the, the real state of play in the justice sector. And I do believe that, you know, after this discussion, we can draw some important conclusions that will give us guidance as to how we could really, you know, address this issue. But for me, this is absolutely unacceptable to have a Minister of Justice not appearing in a meeting before the committee. Ms. Cholo, how do you see uh, really the work of the Commission, the interest of public, and to what extent all the relevant stakeholders are interested in, in your deliverables, in, in the work that you do and the results that you have achieved? I would say that there is a really great interest in the work of the committee, and I think that this is, um, you know, the first time, not only in 20 years, but I would say since the Dayton Peace Agreement onwards, Never ever a committee in the parliament dealt with the justice sector. After re justice reform in 2000, when AJPC was established and when certain, you know, a set of l procedural and, and um, substantive laws have been adopted, somehow we all created an image that justice sector is untouchable because, you know, whatever you, you would do or question about them would be considered an attack. Um, to their independence. But we, of course, um, we are not really dealing with their cases or their work, and therefore we do not really 
deal with the issue of their independence, but we really want to assess how efficient the justice sector is. And because obviously we have this uh, impunity syndrome, in particular in uh, you know cases of corruption, because we have such a low level of corruption cases being prosecuted and convicted. For example, you know, only 232 indictments have been uh, filed for the cases of corruption in, in 2020, you know, so I mean, and if you take into account the number of prosecutors across the country, then this would not be even one indictment per prosecutor in a year, and not to mention the high profile corruption. So it's only 0.5% in the total number of the indictments in the justice sector. So the prosecutor's office of BIH and Republika Srpska prosecutor's office and Sarajevo prosecutor's office, because Sarajevo is um, you know, the biggest canton with 400,000 population and Tuzla canton, they have not filed a single high level uh, corruption indictment. So we have now opened the discussion about justice sector in order for the public to see what's going on there because lots of people are really dissatisfied with the justice uh, sector and their work because there are indeed um, many judges and prosecutors who are very diligent and who are investing a lot of effort and want to be acknowledged for the work that they do we really wanted to give them a room to tell us about what's wrong with the system and i think that this is the greatest achievement of this committee we have opened the justice sector to public of this country because public general public of this country now has the opportunity to learn about irregularities and what's wrong or what's not good about the justice system we will of course propose measures or the laws to improve this law okay we will try to uh, put all these projects in some context because of course every second prosecutor in 2019 at all levels of the government would file an indictment which in a way deals with a particular case so do you have maybe just to help you you know one line in bosnia and herzegovina there are 362 prosecutors at different levels of government from the state level to the local you know cantonal or municipal prosecutors 362 prosecutors in 19 prosecutors offices in 2019 they all have filed only one high level corruption only one so, so 362 prosecutors in 19 prosecutors' offices across Bosnia and Herzegovina have altogether filed only one high-level corruption, which has been confirmed by the court. But what does this really mean, Ms. Korajlic? Because, you know, when we look at a regional uh, concept or even wider, if we speak about the efficiency of the um, justice sector, you know, only one well in 2019 there was only one conviction you know one final decision and this was the case um, of the prosecutor's office of bih because this is part of their jurisdiction you know they are responsible for high level corruption or high profile corruption so bih prosecutor's office is rather arbitrary arbitrary in a sense of deciding what cases they will take over or from different prosecutors' offices, because there are obviously no clear criteria as to how they do this. For years, we've been warning about the level of prosecution of corruption is very low. So the statistics that we speak about are not realistic, because if you look at what is uh, really considered um, corruption by the AJPC and what uh, courts and the prosecutors' offices really imply under corruption when they do their statistics, I think that we could freely say that one third of all the stuff that they reported as corruption cannot be really considered corruption. For example, a worker at the gas station who steals some money from the cashier is considered among you know uh, cases related to corruption and in the statistics this appears to be corruption case so even these numbers that we have 200 or so cases which is pretty much approximate number each year so part of that is not at all corruption and it is really mainly petty corruption where we have um police officers you know who took a bribe of 20 km 
or when you look even the work of the prosecutor's office of BIH, you know, because they are competent for prosecution of people uh, employed in the institutions of BIH, you will see that even these few cases not mentioning the 2020, but if we look at 2019, because obviously, you know, last year was like very specific and some political cases were filed. But again, you know, most of these cases are really related to some petty corruption cases, you know, so we're not talking about some major or high profile corruption cases. So that's why I think we need to be aware that now our prosecutor's offices, in particular BIH prosecutor's office, are now in the role or in the service of the politics. And they have been used for different political, um, you know, quarrels with, um, you know, political opponents. So we're not talking about, you know, the opponents of certain political parties, but we're talking about, you know, fighting uh, the, the war with those within the same party who do not agree with, you know, the views of the of the majority of, of, of the body. So obviously, you know, even the cases that we see, for example, in the last year, many of them are really politically motivated. You know, some of the spectacular arrests or recording uh, or taping people who are apprehending people, all this really is a show because in the end we don't have final court decisions. And of course, this raises the question of the quality of the indictments. And we see that most of these indictments are either rejected or returned for amending. And based on this, we could see that many things are done only for the PR purposes, you know, or as a result of some political quarrels, you know, because in our context, we don't see any sincere effort in fighting corruption, you know, because even when the cases are filed, they're filed because you know, it's a right political moment for someone to be prosecuted. I'm not saying that they shouldn't be doing this, but I'm trying to point out that they are applying a very selective approach because, you know, if we look at the, um, you know, other levels, you know, this is, for example, you know, this case of the um, silver raspberry with the ventilators, that's, there was a lot of media attention, a huge pressure. The institution immediately started tackling this case, but at the same time, there was even bigger crime in Republika Srpska also about procurement of ventilators and medical equipment, which is much, much bigger than the silver raspberry. But no one really raised question about that, nor the prosecutor's office of BIH even addressed this issue. But how can we change this? You know, because, you know, this has been reported for years. There is a public, you know, present and obviously, you know, you can re make very good PR in particular in the election years, but again, it seems to me that somehow we are in a far worse positions than ten, before. Yes, we are. Now, it, uh, it's a very unfortunate to say this, but even for this um, ad hoc inquiry committee, you know, so, I mean, we really need, need to wait for such a body to start doing something to reveal, you know, um, certain things which point to involvement of some justice uh, people from justice sector. So, and if it wasn't for this, then probably, you know, unless there were some cases, you know, uh, related to, to uh, justice affairs, this commission would have never been, uh, uh, you know, established as such. And of course, you know, obviously the parliaments became somehow only the body to confirm what the executive power does. But I think that we really need to, um, you know, be more serious about it, you know, because it's not enough to only publicly speak about, you know, these corruption cases, corruption cases within justice sector. And if it does, this doesn't really lead to some final outcome, be it amendments to the AJPC law or some uh, other reform within justice sector, if we don't see any further actions about this, then I'm afraid that all of this will just simply remain, you know, PR, which was suitable for, at a time. Mr. Baich, what would be your first step if we speak about dealing, you know, with, with this matter? Now we have this um, committee to address, you know, some of the, the burning issues in the justice sector. So what would be the next step? 
So what is it that um, all these relevant stakeholders should do together to, to address the issue properly? I will try not to repeat with what has been said so far, you know, because I agree with most of it, but I would just like to mention another problem that we have in justice sector. Namely, when we did justice reform, in a way we got some Western democratic model in our justice system, which include you know, um, you know, integrity, democratic principles, um, relations with the public, public relations, etc. So, so these concepts are really planted on the soil that is inherited from the previous system. You know, I'm calling this a cultural defect because we have a culture of where people do not really want to uh, hold grudges against one another. They don't want to be, they don't want to create enemies. And this was pretty much present in the previous system, you know. So we have like, you know, central committee or, you know, some intelligence agencies. In the past system, you would have a judge who could try when two neighbors have a quarrel over, you know, the border. But they couldn't, for example, try a political dissident because as such, they would simply not sustain in the system. And I believe that we have somehow kept pretty much of that culture. And now we could establish that like 362 prosecutors that, and I don't know how many judges, we have a huge body of people who, according to law, have a discretionary right to independently assess evidence and render decisions in democracy in Western countries, it's very difficult to interfere into their assessment of evidence. And now among those thousand or 2000 judges and prosecutors, we have somehow this wrong culture, which is like, okay, not really, you know, this collegiality is completely misunderstood because in the West, collegiality means that you would help a colleague to improve. But in our context, collegiality, I would really codify it as a criminal offense because when you report irregularity of your colleague prosecutor, you know, the prosecutor, chief prosecutor would say, how could you do that to a colleague? You know, you shouldn't be doing it. So this culture is a common culture here. For example, police officer will never report another police officer because you are not owed to do that. And I think that this is often used as a cover for different criminal offenses that are taking place. And this is why we have situation where a chief prosecutor of a canton, you know, for example, there is a transparency international that will report to them irregularity about some of their prosecutors and why how come that an ngo could file criminal charges or disciplinary actions but the chief prosecutor will not prosecute or will not really do anything about you know their prosecutors you know so i would say that this is an organism that lives in this old system pretending to imply to, to apply some new democratic you know concepts you know so what i'm trying to say is that for as long as we have this problem in justice sector we will not be able whether our laws are good or not for example um at a cantonal court in sarajevo there is a huge debate because one party to the proceedings realized that when they dislike a judge they simply file a libel case, you know, and they sue whatever, you know, uh, party. And, you know, the court then, you know, there is actually, uh, they file a libel case against the judge. And since this is a civil case in parallel with the criminal case, then such judge will be excused, you know, and they will get another judge. So, as I said, like, you know, yes, we do have some new democratic principles, you know, and there are people who would like to do something about protecting justice and pointing to abuse of right when a party files, for example, you know, you know, this case, 
takes place in Sarajevo, but you go to Bihać court and you file a, a case against the judge in Sarajevo and they will simply excuse this judge or they will replace it because there is a conflict of interest. And you can do this perpetually until you get to the judge that suits you. So obviously there is a huge debate between an old fashioned culture, for example, here in Kento municipal court in Sarajevo, who have very rigid approach and they feel that such judge should be actually uh, taken off the case and between a younger uh, population or younger colleagues who somehow have more holistic approach to interpreting the law because obviously the law have certain principles you know and there are certain provisions in these laws that convey some democratic spirit and some provisions in these laws provide you protection against the abuse of this right. Okay, you spoke about collegiality, but I would like to go back to the parliament and, you know, obviously we have problem of lack of collegiality between the committee or the support of SNSD and um, HDZ in forming of, of this commission. So why is it important to have full support of all political parties, you know. So what could happen with everything that you will do now in, in the year of your existence if you don't have the uh, support of these two political parties? Well, we have enough hands in the House of Representatives. If that were the case, the committee could never have been formed. I mean, it is a slight majority, but it is the majority. The problem might arise in the House of peoples not necessarily required for the adoption of our reports but mandatory for the adoption of the laws so um, in the house of peoples they have the majority and if they object to the adoption of the law the laws will not be adopted we need the house of peoples for that and as i've already mentioned i don't want to repeat the laws that i'm talking about here are a requirement for the candidate status uh, for membership in the european union so if we do not have support to these laws in the house of peoples this will mean literally no support for further European path of Bosnia and Herzegovina. We have to take a comparative perspective here. The Republic of Serbia waited exactly two years and two months to get its candidate status. Croatia, one year, four months. Montenegro, exactly two years. Last year, five years have passed since the moment Mr. Čović, as the then chairperson of the presidency, uh, since he uh, applied formally for uh, the status. So we've been waiting for more than five years. Why is this candidate status important for Bosnia and Herzegovina? First of all, before we get the status, we cannot open the chapters. We cannot start uh, with the actual work on them. But on the other hand, it's like when you see the everyday life, that means that we do not have access to many European funds that we could have access to if we were the candidate. There is no doubt in my view that we would be much better situation in procuring the vaccines, solidarity with the European Union. I mean, if we were the, the candidate country and we are not. So all of the above is not the lack of collegiality with the inquiry committee. I mean, even without the SNSD and HDZ, we have made huge progress and I am particularly proud of, and Ambassador Nelson mentioned it, is this, uh, this collegiality that we have within the committee. We have eight members coming from six different political parties, both from the Federation and Republika Srpska. And it's not that we are collaborating and cooperating. We are showing something that hasn't been seen at the political scene of Bosnia and Herzegovina yet. This is what I'm particularly proud of. And that guarantees that we will produce a very good report that will be adopted at the House of Representatives. But when it comes to the laws, those people who will vote against the laws, they will not damage the committee, they will damage the citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina because these laws are requirements for the accession process. 
I believe that a very important part of that report will be devoted to public procurement. There are two subtopics to say, so green public procurement and public procurement in extraordinary circumstances. Mr. Borenovic, we've had cases of corruption that happened during the state of emergency, so let us hear what can be done on the prosecution of these cases. I'm sure that some of these examples will be in the report. As members of the committee, we will insist to introduce, in addition to the need to legislative changes and in addition to what the parliament can do, we will share examples that show this recklessness. And I'm thinking now of a word uh, to explain what was going on. It was just uh, uh, disgraceful. Mrs. Korajlic mentioned Srebrna Malina case. It is a case that we all know of. Uh, there were also tourist organizations. There were. There is also a, an example that I think uh, exceeds all of these. Uh, it's the, the case of Mediatic uh, Company that got the exclusive right and exemption from Article 10, meaning exemption from applying the procedure, procedures of public procurement for procurement of medical equipment, devices and uh, ventilators. The amount was over 35 million convertible marks. Four contracts have been signed uh, end of March and beginning of April. And one of these contracts, in fact, refers to the most uh, uh, expensive ventilators, VG70, and the price of one was 157,000 convertible marks per one unit. So 6.8 millions was a total, total amount. So that would not be strange in itself, were there not four additional 150 or 180 ventilators procured in the total amount of 22, 23 convertible marks. I mean, don't take me literally, the exact data will be included in the report. So as a members of this committee, we had no idea that we will reveal such things and such data. And there was silence of the institutions that were supposed to do their jobs. So what we did is we asked for data from the uh, agency uh, for medical equipment and devices, because all of the equipment imported into Bosnia and Herzegovina must cross the border and must have customs clearance. And we really found out about some incredible facts. When we started this discussion about the ventilator procurement in on 8 June uh, in 2020, until then, Mediatic imported ventilators in the amount of 4 million convertible marks and charge the fund for health insurance for 20 million convertible marks. So the difference is 15 million. And we've heard the statements of the fund that this is a political conflict, that the ventilators are needed, that they arrived, that they needed them to save the, the lives of citizens. And we've also heard the statements of the police structures that they opened the case, that they're working on it. The prosecutor's office received the criminal reports. I mean, allegedly the work started on them, but so far we haven't seen any results of this process. So you can see the, the abuse and the recklessness in the emergency situation and the procurement of ventilators that were you know, necessary for the lives of those, these citizens. I mean, you import something that's worth 4 million and you charge over 20 million convertible marks for that. And the nine instances of import, one of them, one of them only listed the amount of money, no quantity, no items, nothing. So imagine a company, for instance, importing 30 cars and just stating, okay, this is the value of the cars without listing what cars were there, what type of items. I mean, it's a manipulation with the quantities and with the, the actual ventilators and devices. I mean, we did not know 
from that document what they imported. And I'm saying this because this is really an incredible story that has a sequel. Once the public started discussing after 8th June, and the procurement of ventilators, all of a sudden, these very expensive ventilators arrive, but only end, end of June. So 85 days later, at extremely high prices, because you have the entire octopus of, you know, hushing up the entire case, the customs terminals, the, the, the taxes and everything. I mean, they needed to to explain or to justify this extreme profit. So there were different methods that they applied. I mean, there are very serious grounds of suspicion that we are sharing here based on the data that we've received from the official institutions in this country. So this is not something that we've produced in any way. We got the documents, the data from official institutions, and based on that data, we are telling you this. And I am angry and I'm also sad because of the silence of the institutions. And some of the institutions in this country worked in the interest of uh, these actors. Not just the health insurance fund that spent the public money in enormous amounts. It's a private company that I really don't care about. It's a private company. They have the interest to make profit. They have their own codes of conduct. But for me, the indirect taxation authority is in question here. They don't have data as to the number of items, the number of ventilators that entered the country. And the conduct of the prosecutor's office and the police agencies that are still silent. And then we go to transparency and we get the data from them. You definitely monitored this scandal and all other scandals. So what would you pull, single out from 2020 in terms of corruption and abusing the pandemic for these purposes? Yes, from the very onset of the pandemic, we were warning about the abuses. I mean, not only the exemptions from the application of the public procurement law, there were abuses of other types of public procurement procedures under the pretext of these emergency uh, uh, circumstances. So negotiating procedures without publication of notice, we've had cases where uh, there were direct procedures to contract in negotiated procedures with companies that do not have a license to import medical equipment or to put them on the market here. So there were direct negotiations with non-qualified tenderers. So, you know, these were contracts with tourist agencies, architectural offices. All of that also we linked to the Public Health Institute in the Republic Srpska. We filed uh, criminal reports, I mean, on various of these cases, but there is no further information as to what the prosecutor's office did. The RS prosecutor's office was supposed to do that. Then we had SIPA investigating something, and then we had the abuse of the procedure during these few days. So there was the blocking and then uh, the unblocking of, of uh, the accounts. You know, it, it was it, it was made possible for the funds to leave the account. And of course, you never see it again. The case will not be uh, put to an end. I mean, we will not prove that someone unlawfully profited. The pandemic, in fact, revealed all the flaws of the system that are there, all the, the deficiencies of the public procurement law, all the flows in the access uh, to information and transparency of public procurement. Well, people simply started paying attention to this because it was an emergency situation and human lives were at stake. Every year in public procurement corruption, we lose hundreds of millions. They're abused, stolen, they disappear. But it seems that we've stopped thinking about this. The millions have become abstract. 
Let me think of an example. Just a few days ago, we filed a criminal report uh, relating to public procurement conducted by a public enterprise is worth 30 million km. Nobody pays much attention to the millions. But now we've started noticing because this, these, there are human lives at stake. There are human lives that are directly jeopardized by corruption. And that corruption existed before the pandemic and will continue to exist. But if we have a selective approach as to what we're going to prosecute and what not, why then have them stop in doing this? So we see now the obstructions uh, about the amendments to, to the public procurement law. And as Mr. Anout mentioned, this is one of the priorities set by the European Union. So after a number of years, and the draft was made by the working group uh, established by the Council of Ministers. So for years, that draft has been sitting there. And now finally, we've had a discussion at the Council of Ministers and the draft was supported. However, the provisions that refer to uh, increased oversight and supervision have been taken out. So again, we just have the surface makeup change. Everything will be fine. There will be transparency. I mean, yes, we do need these provisions, but we need control. We need control. We, the agency could have a role to act in due time and to prevent abuses. I mean, if we don't have that, all other mechanisms just lose their point. And we've had this practice for years now of all the institutions that were supposed to control and supervise the public spending, the uh, selection and recruitment procedure, the electoral process, all of this is becoming pointless because all of these processes are either pushed under direct political control or where that is not possible, then the authorities and competencies are being reduced and therefore these stakeholders can no longer implement the laws the way they should. The same is with you know, political party financing, public procurement, conflict of interest, all of these areas that are necessary for the prevention of abuses. And once the abuse happens, once we have a criminal offense, the judicial institutions are under direct control and service of the political parties. So things just remain at that. And this shows us that this in fact demonstrates the attitude of the state and those who are the decision makers. When we adopted the laws and we established the institutions, I mean, it was done so that we don't shatter these structures. So the bodies that have been established are either too weak because their competencies are weak or if they're not weak, they have their people put there uh, as the appointees to, to implement the laws. Now I'd like to call our participants to use the Q&A or chat options uh, if you have comments. Also, there is a, a, the Facebook page. We have half an hour left for the dis discussion, so I invite you to take part with questions and comments. Mrs. Cholom. We've heard about cases that have been dominant in the public discourse of so ventilators, Srebrenica, mediatic ventilators, Pandora, etc. When we talk about the witnesses that you've heard uh, uh, by the, at the committee, did the witnesses talk about some of these subjects? I mean, what have you managed to achieve in the context of shedding light on these cases? Well, the people who uh, appeared at public hearings uh, were reluctant to give a much detail about specific cases because their justification was that they might jeopardize the proceedings. But there is the Pandora case, for instance. Um, it's been there for a long time uh, and we do not see any epilogue to it. What is characteristic is that there is either no prosecutorial or a, a judicial epilogue, so there is no judgment. We, we don't see the final say, something that will punish the perpetrator and also serve as preventive mechanisms for the others who, would, who are planning to uh, commit such criminal offense. 
No, any judgment will have two functions. So it's special and general prevention. Special prevention refers to uh, the or the specific prevention refers to the person who is being convicted. So that person will know not repeat such a criminal offense or any other criminal offense, but there is a general prevention aspect of any judgment, which means to work on the prevention of such crimes in the society in general. So other people, when they see that someone was convicted, will be reluctant to uh, to take on such a criminal offense. So I am the role of the court and the role of the prosecutor's office as well, but primarily the court and the judgments of the court have the greatest uh, uh, impact in the prevention. So when you have a court, you know, passing a convicting judgment, you know, that will be applying the full sanction without any lenient punishing mechanisms. I was, I was, I don't know, prosecutor for 10 years and of the thousand uh, judgments, we've had 90% of suspended sentences. So this is the criminal sanctioning policy. I mean, always go for a, a milder sanction, especially when we're talking about corruption. And here you have the range that goes up to 15 years of imprisonment. So the court has this possibility to individualize the sanction, taking into account the elements of the criminal offense, but also the elements of the personal criminal liability of the, the individual. So whether there was um, intention or maybe the person was just under a wrong impression of something. But uh, uh, first of all, the courts must be ready and willing to have a more strict sanctioning policy, applying fully the criminal codes, and these judgments must be confirmed in the second instance procedure. We don't have many convicting final judgments. In all of these cases, we still don't have a convicting judgment. And the question is whether we will see it. I think that a higher number of uh, convicting judgments would definitely contribute to prevention and to the reduction of corruption in this country. So the judiciary must live up to this task. It must not be under the influence of politics. They must be independent, impartial, and fully responsible and accountable at the position that the society uh, gave them. They must protect the society from criminals. Unless they do that, we will just fail as a society. No politics can can protect you, you know, from the abyss. My question for Mr. Baich, is it possible that all these affairs that we have mentioned and we know from the experience before, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, lot to do an, about nothing, but you know, the point here is actually, can we really expect something out of this, you know? In my experience, I think that the prosecutors do not have capacities to play against the big players. What does this mean? They do not have courage, they don't have knowledge or what? Well, before we get to the political support, I need to say that we in prosecutor's offices or in generally in state institutions that have some repressive uh, powers, such as tax authorities, indirect taxation authority, prosecutors, we have a lot of negligence. And we also have, um, you know, the level of comfort, you know, being that actually they're very arrogant, I would say, you know, they feel that like, you know, they're beyond the reach. And I will explain what I mean by this, you know, this negligence and arrogance injustice. For example, a prosecutor files an indictment and sends it to the court for confirmation. And then you have a stamp at the protocol that at 11 o'clock you have sent your information, uh, you know, for confirmation. And the indictment may be like, let's say, 700 page document. But at the very same day, at 2 o'clock and 30, they, you know, the judge for preliminary hearing confirms the indictment. Can you tell me that judge really managed in a couple of hours to read 700 page document? Well, it's impossible. I know that a large number of businessmen are racketeered. And when you have a big player 
who's really, you know, powerful. It, you know, this person might be politician, very powerful, and involved in high-level uh, corruption. Such persons have capacity to hire the best possible lawyer and to simply find thousands of procedural mistakes made by the prosecutor's office. And I will tell you one example that might be shocking. For example, a method that is often used in our prosecutor's offices is proving evidence through special investigative activities, such as wiretapping, undercover agents, and so on. So we have a situation where prosecutors and judges, I mean, judge would approve uh, special investigative techniques, and in the order approving such techno, you know, techniques, they need to explain why they, um, you know, why you are so invasive in terms of actually my privacy, you know. So this is not done by the by the court at all. They simply say like because of um, disproportional difficulties in collecting evidence, they approve such measures. And you know what happens that in Croatia, in case Dragojevic, Strasbourg court has revoked a judgment because one such order was not reasoned. This was a judgment from a few years ago, and of course, after that, Croatia undergo, uh, underwent a complete reform, but in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we haven't really learned anything from that. So virtually, in our context, every such order is identical, copied and pasted. And of course, it can very easily be challenged and decisions made based upon evidence may be revoked, you know. So, of course, you know, I mean, if you are someone who's really ignorant about law, you know, you know, then it's very easy to somehow win the case. But if you play against some serious players, politicians with power, they will never, never win the case against such politicians again. You know, when we say that, like, okay, you know, the indictment was, you know, um, um, that the indictment has been uh, cancelled or that have been lost for, for whatever reason, you know, this is because all these evidence collected through such measures can be challenged and discarded. So I just wonder how come that no one from the prosecutor's office really read this because NGOs do that. We see that this happens and happened in, in the neighboring countries. So, you know, now we are astonished to see that NGOs are more diligent in monitoring what's going on in the neighboring country and in Strasbourg, whereas the professionals in the justice sector don't do that, even though this would be part of their job. Amil Ducic from Focus Ba asked a question through the chat and he said, without prejudicing like what will be established in your reports, how do you look at the political influence at the court of Bosnia and Herzegovina and prosecutor's office of Bosnia and Herzegovina? Because often we see that there are some influences exerted on some of the key persons from these two institutions. Well, we talked about this problem. We actually raised many questions, you know, in particular people, holders of judicial functions, and some of them provided very specific answers, namely what I think that today we will have a 26th session of our body, you know, but what's really uh, pervasing all our discussions is that actually What our witnesses have told us in these discussions really show us that we have huge problem with justice sector when it comes to political influence. And this influence is actually taking place at different levels. What we all have witnessed, and we all agreed on this, promotion in justice system implies that you need to have some support by whatever political option. For example, we've heard some shocking testimonies where people told us that they simply cannot be promoted unless they are supported by some political options. And all this really corresponds with what we um, 
assumed, namely vast majority of people in the justice sector are good and they are very fair and honest and they are doing their job in the best possible way. So I would say that we have 85 to 90 percent of such people, but the problem is with the remaining 5 percent. So and of course, this is something that blurring the overall picture because 95% sounds very good. But if you have 5 to 10% of managerial staff backed by political system, then this really means that this influence is huge because those 95% cannot do their job as they should. In a panel that we had a few days ago, most of us actually attended this, this uh, event, we've heard that there are some very serious indications, and I think that Ms. Kuralic spoke about this, but there are some serious indications that prosecutors cannot file an indictment without the consent or approval of the chief prosecutor of BIH prosecutor's office. And this is enormous pressure if this is true, you know. So, of course, I don't want to really speculate as to what we will have in our report, but I would say that, you know, we do have problems that have been somehow confirmed in all these testimonies that we have heard. Uh, yes, of course, we heard a lot about the work of AJPC. In the meantime, we, there was actually a replacement in the management. So what, does this really mean something significant, you know? So what do you as a committee do with respect to the work of AJPC? Well, we all agreed that the key of success in justice sector are people, people who will be courageous enough, determined, determined and professional, people who have ju justice or judicial integrity, integrity to do their job efficiently, and that is the key to success of justice sector irrespective of the existing legislation, because of course, you know, this is something that is uh, amended over the time. But discussing with some people from the justice sector, we spoke about them, whether there is a really sufficient number of people that are really, really ready to ad address some of the challenges. Well, I would say that one of the results of our committee was that we have encouraged fair and honest people in the justice sector to do something about these anomalies. We had some judges and prosecutors who were very exact in speaking about abuses in the justice system and they they spoke about things that are to be absolutely com condemned and could be even considered um you know criminal offense so in Brčko district judge told us actually that some cases have been allocated to judges that are suitable judges for the case so for se several seconds the system is shut off in order to play the software in order for the case to be assigned to the judge to whom the particular case is owed to be assigned you know so this is really something that has been confirmed by a few other people you know but this tells us actually that indeed we need to have an overall resetting of the justice sector I think that we have started this process. It might not go as fast as we wish, but I think it is important that, that we have embarked on this effort and that we ensure that, um, you know, this process is, is corrected, you know. And in this respect, AJPC as an institution has a very important role. So, but this, uh, this change that happened at the, in the management of AJPC, does this really have some significant uh, effect? Well, it remains to be seen, you know, so I think that we still have the key problem and that problem is the syndrome that Mr. Bai spoke about, you know, uh, omission, not um, reporting the colleagues or the collegiality, but in a negative sense, you know, so we just need to people to reassure us that they will not really play by that rule like you know that they will not um that they will not refrain from reporting the wrongdoings of their colleagues you know okay and we still have some 15 minutes before the end of our discussion we got five uh, two questions through zoom 
one for Mr. Cholo and another for um, Haris Chutahia from the Foreign Political Initiative as, uh, asks, how international community can help Bosnia and Herzegovina in fighting corruption? Is this only an affirmative support in a sense to um, identify the problems or draft strategies or maybe some radical uh, movements such as like you know blacklisting bosnia you know in in some respect well i think that blocking the funds is the most efficient measure tomorrow we are to endorse an agreement with the european commission uh for the assistance intended for COVID-19, we are talking about 230 million. The first trench will be right away and another trench will be three months later, provided that Bosnia and Herzegovina meets some of the main criteria imposed by the European Commission. So to speak to politicians in Bosnia and Herzegovina, this is the only way. So this is the only language they understand. All ultimatums, you know, you, you can't really they, are, they do not understand any other language, you know. So if we are really trying to uh, affect or make an impact on their conscience, I don't think that the results will be as fruitful. Another very important question from Ms. Hassan Begovic, Mr. Korajlic. Do you think that Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, will get the capacities to tackle high profile corruption or maybe such cases will be actually established or forwarded to the International Court of Corruption if and when such body is established. So what do you think of this? I don't think it's realistic that we form whatever international body. What is absolutely necessary to do is to fully reform the process, how the regulatory body, namely AJPC, does its work so we need to have a new ajpc law which will include responsibilities and and um, liability of the members of ajpc and once all these accountability uh, mechanisms are in place we need to reinforce the integrity and more strict disciplinary liability so wider specter of sanctions for, for you know any disciplinary breaches and what we have suggested as a very important solution was implementation of detailed review of all holders of judicial function modeled by some uh, models applied in the other countries because we need to somehow really purify the system in a sense you know because we cannot really expect, you have now asked about the JPC, changing few people in this body in the long term will mean nothing unless we change the way how decisions are rendered. And obviously, you know, but we will get into the situation that a few years later, such people will again develop their own schemes or networks. And of course, this practice will simply perpetuate. But I think that we need to work on a systemic level, you know, so, but changing individuals means nothing, you know, but if coupled with institutional change, then we might expect some result because we need to make sure that people who are in these functions are not in connection with organized crime groups, that they have not been um, in situations that they have obtained property legally, because there is a lot of resistance, you know, with the asset declaration of Oxo, you know, because all this really tells us that, you know, there is a lot of work in uh, that to be done in parallel with the um, institutional and, and legislative framework, you know, so we might need some draconian measures to really, uh, you know, do something, but we can't really deceive ourselves with making some cosmetic changes, training or whatever, because we are currently in the position where we need to have a complete reset of the system. But to expect, um, you know, support from the international community by establishing whatever international body, that would really lead us to, again, lack of accountability, you know, because if you are expecting others to solve our problems, then where is our accountability? Where is our liability, you know? So, but 
Is it possible that this is something really, you know, uh, is this something that can be supported by the political elites? Well, yes, we expect that laws be developed by those who actually develop this situation. And of course, that this is something that uh, plays to their favor because now they have the full control of the justice system and they know that if they lose this control, they will be prosecuted. And, you know, as I said, the only way, maybe I'm expecting again a lot, um, you know, from the international community, but since nothing changed in 25 years, the only way is by conditioning politicians financially, because we are currently in the situation that we we would do whatever for whatever funds, you know, because our budgets are in a crisis and only financial conditioning we could really make them do some things, you know, but now making appeals or requests or, you know, all of us here in Bosnia and Herzegovina, I think that we cannot really do much about it because now we see this from this example, because there is no interest in becoming a member of EU member, um, you know, family. So political parties are not interested in that. They're not interested in becoming part of the Un European Union or really, um, you know, doing anything about it, you know, because they don't see their personal interest in that. But when they get to the situation where, where they would not have funding to finance their political armies, where they would not have enough money to uh, buy the elections, then maybe they will maybe start doing some things. Well, in context of the financial condition conditions, uh, Mr. Bajic, it is very important to tackle the prism of the international um, the funders uh, and their perspective of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Well, um, in the American Chamber of Commerce, I deal with ethics. So we have companies. Uh, members from Bosnia and Herzegovina and the United States of America. And the American anti-corruption laws in economy are the most rigorous in the world. So any companies that do business with the United States must be very careful because they can get to the, uh, you know, red lists and black lists of the, uh, uh, of the American partners. So corruption is a huge problem for the development of economy. We cannot have foreign investors come and do business here. You know, they are being blackmailed by the tax offices. Uh, the courts are not doing uh, their job. Any foreign investor cannot see a contract as a legal certainty. So if you have a contract with a toxic company in Bosnia and Herzegovina thinking, well, this is legal certainty, you have to be aware in advance that the toxic company from Bosnia and Herzegovina, your partner that cheated you, will rely heavily on the judiciary that will delay the proceedings for seven or eight years. And when they lose, they will again go to the, uh, to, uh, uh, the Supreme Court and will be able to win. I mean, having a contract means nothing when the judiciary is not effective. That's one hand, on the one hand. On the other hand, and I, I really say this 100% certain, and I do have evidence to corroborate it, the prosecutor's office in a great number of cases uses these cases for predatory purposes. So we have a faulty judiciary, in fact. So when you have the process of trying to get a bribe, the process is excellent. If you are targeted by anyone, first, you soon get controls, inspections, and then your tax inspection will scare you with an interpretation of the law. Then the prosecutors will also try to intimidate you. Okay, this can be money laundry, tax evasion, punishable by prison. I mean, the judiciary is the cancer and the death of development of business in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And another shocking event I'd like to share with you. A former employee of the Federation Police Administration told me 
about a case that was very suspicious with respect to legality of the prosecutor's office action against an economic operator. They told me, listen, there is something that's called a setup in the police. So they use this term, Montirka, a setup. So when the inspector asks, is this a setup or this is just a regular report? Can you imagine the extent of corruption? So in my view, everything is a problem, of course. Uh, it's a problem if a high-ranking uh, politician or Fadil Novalic uh, being uh, sanctioned for the ventilators. It's all important, I understand. But what is happening in the business sector, in the economy, completely undermines any future in Bosnia and Herzegovina, undermines the creation of jobs. And of course, people will leave. The problems in the judiciary are so significant and so burning that there is no higher priority than that. So what you're doing in the committee, please, you need 20 more committees. There is no other topic but this to resolve uh, the problems of this country. Mr. Arnaut, just one sentence. What will be your focus uh, in the coming months? We can expect the report in May, in, in June, in fact. Okay, so today we have the three hearings. Possibly we will have several more until June if the need arises. I am very proud that in addition to the cooperation with the American Embassy and um, the NDI, we have cooperation with the Congress, the US Congress, that uh, has a long-standing tradition of parliamentary oversight through their committees and bodies. So one of the things that we are doing with the American Congress is uh, learning from them how to best organize this. Next month, we have a number of sessions with um, the congressmen and staffers uh, of the US Congress, and we will be, in fact, discussing the method of drafting this report. So this is something that we uh, will be doing in the next few months. We have to um, compile the report. And if we see that there are no indications of the laws coming from the Council of Ministers, that will be our focus as well. I'm sure that the public was looking forward to this report, especially the journalists. And I have to say that without the journalists and investigative reporting, many of these affairs would not have been revealed. So they really show the strength and inspiration, even though when the prosecutor's office and the judiciary are a bit reluctant. We will talk about this topic uh, during the panel that will start at 11.15. The title is on investigative reporting and its role in the society. The moderator will be Alexander Hershum. So I invite you to continue um, to stay with us for the next panels. And by this, I would like to end this panel of our conference, 100 Faces of Corruption. I would like to welcome you to this panel discussion. I'm Alexander Hershum. This is the a second panel that we will um, use to discuss the media investigative reporting and its role in the society, whether it's in the service of the public interest or it flatters the audience, whether it builds credibility or seeks attention. We are, are expecting your questions and comments during this panel. Please, all of you who are joining us online, um, become a part of the story. Dialogue is the start to any problem resolution. The citizens are the most important aspect of any country, including Bosnia and Herzegovina. Let us hear what the citizens uh, think about investigative journalists and investigative reporting and how much it can help us in this fight against corruption. Istraživačko novinarstvo oko nas. Šta to danas radi novinar istraživač?
Istraživačko novinarstvo i vlast. Istraživačko novinarstvo i građani. Osta objektivni, nisu naši pod uticajem vlast, da im sad neko mora da diktira kako će da se ponašaju, šta smiju da objave, šta ne smiju da objave. Mislim da je to poljuljano povjerenje. Da nije njih što šta bi bilo, jer je vlast takva sve po tepih da gura, a ne vole kad se priča o njima, vole samo afirmaciju. Smatram da ima istraživačkih novinara koji ne rade posao baš kako bi trebali raditi. Ima agencija koje spričavaju taj rad, sve neke radnje koje nisu baš tačne. Smatram da je istraživačko novinarstvo jako bitan faktor za cjelokupno društvo. državi, to je malo kompleksan posao, zahtjeva puno snage i prije svega hrabrosti, jer nekako su svi novinar danas podloženi urednicima, a urednici politici, tako da mislim da ga sve manje i manje ima u našoj državi. Pa vjerujem, na opću situaciju u kakvoj se nalazimo nije loše svaki medijsko eksponiranje i istraživanje i spoznaje nekih novih zaključaka, ideja i tako. Da li vjerujete u rad istraživačkih novinara? Pa iskreno moje mišljenje je vjerujem. Zašto ne bi vjerovala sad? Ima svega i riječi koje nisu istinite i rečenica. Ma svega ima, ali zašto ne bi vjerovali? Istraživački rad i u svakom poslu koji vaše mora biti dobro. To je i poželje. Nema istraživačkog novinarca, ne postoji. Da li vjerujete u rad istraživačkih novinara? Da. Vjerovatno se oni trude, ne svi, ali većina ih se trudi da to bude istraživačko novinarstvo, međutim vrlo je teško. U današnjim uslovima da se bavite istraživačkim novinarstvom je vrlo, vrlo teško. Istraživačkih novinara? Pa ne znam, vjerovatno, ako radi dobro svoj posao. Samo koliko su oni kompromitirani to, ali vjerujem u principu, vjerujem. Da li vjerujete u rad istraživačkih novinara? Samo pojedinih, vrlo je mali broj tih. Mislim, uglavnom ono što može da se pročite što se servira kroz internet, novine, uglavnom mislim da je to već što pripremljeno da ljudima se stvara neko mišljenje, javno mnjenje, a da je vrlo malo novinara koji baš istražuju i svoj nezavisan stav iskažu kroz to, u stvari realan stav na osnovu činjenice. Pa ne vjerujem, ne vjerujem u rad, ne vjerujem nikom, pa ne vjerujem ni u rad novinara, nikom ne vjerujem. Novinare i istraživače upoređuju sa policijskim inspektorima, špijunima, uhodama, i vrhunskim analitičarima. I u svemu tome ima neke istine. Istraživačko novinarstvo danas između senzacije i kredibiliteta. Novinarstvo između služenja javnosti i povlađivanja ukusu publike. Još jednom dobrodošli, očekujemo vaše... Once again, welcome. We will be expecting your comments, contributions and questions. We will hear from Leila Turčo, Faculty of Political Sciences in Sarajevo, Leila Bičakčić, Investigative Reporting Center, and Sinisha Vukelić, Portal Capital.ba. Let us start with an information that we received today at the Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Today, the main trial is starting in the case Ventilators on 29th January, Srebrna Malina and the defendants um, said they were not guilty. So is this the victory of investigative reporting or 
Well, until we see the final outcome of uh, this trial, uh, we cannot talk about a new victory or a defeat. This is an example of how a good reporting, this wasn't based on investigative reporting, it later led into an investigation. But this definitely tells us that journalism, when led by a good journalist that will report on facts, that can lead to a chain of reactions in the system. Reactions by the institution, reactions by those who have a job to react. That will result in the indictment, like in this case uh, of um, ventilators. We hope we will see an outcome that will benefit the citizens. Hopefully, we will see a judgment that will clearly explain what happened in this case. But it's too early to talk about victory or defeat. Let us now turn to the focus of this discussion. Investigative reporting. Does it mean you enter the darkness and bring out something that no one else knew before? So how do you do it in Bosnia and Herzegovina? Well, investigative reporting, in fact, is a research. So journalists always have this premise. We will share the news that no one else knew before. But the difference between the journalists working in daily press, for instance, and investigative reporter is that the investigative reporter goes deeper into the research. So it's not about informing the public on a daily basis, but it's about a more comprehensive report that includes a large set of data that either uh, go in favor or against the primary thesis. So an old journalist start with a thesis. Of course, at the end of the day, we all want to hear news, something novel that we haven't heard before, that we keep up to date. I mean, on the other hand, we would have to ask the question of what is the economic feasibility of uh, any research. I mean, if you've just confirmed that something that someone else has already confirmed. But investigative reporting it builds upon and is an upgrade of the daily news reporting. It is a very demanding job if you take it on professionally. So if we now draw a parallel between us living in a time when all of us are the media, we all have profiles on social networks, we post our comments, we post our opinions, we're trying to change the social image. How can an investigative reporter succeed in such circumstances? Yes, I do agree with you. We are all informers of the public. I mean, we can all now share information. We can color the information with an emotion. We can present that information in a way that will produce a reaction of the audience, either positive or negative. On the other hand, investigative reporter or journalist is a person who should contribute to the understanding of the issue that they are investigating. They bring into the public space a range of information, a sets of data that classify certain information, but in such a way that it is free of any personal emotion. An investigative reporter does not shape the information. It gives it to the public in such a way that the public can neutrally take this information. That's the role of investigative reporters. It is very difficult, of course, to fight against everything that's going on on social network. It's our reality. And that's why the job of the journalists is being made difficult because journalists are no longer the only information transmitters. However, as professionals, journalists are additionally motivated if they really want to be investigative reporters to share with the audience, with the public, the information that are lacking in the public discourse. It is difficult. And of course, it demands committed and long term work. And that's a key thing. With investigative reporters, 
you cannot have an investigative story unless you've invested a lot of time into it. There are no investigative reporting articles that are produced in short time. Well, re investigative reporting does not fall under sensationalism. And we live in the time of sensationalism and likes. And it seems to me that uh, investigative reporting uh, really requires thorough work. Professor Turcilo, to what extent is the work of the judiciary in Bosnia and Herzegovina transparent in the context of this topic? I think that the task of investigative reporters is to track this, the answer to this question. It's very important to know that investigative reporters or journalists dealing with investigative reporting are not only striving for their information to institute investigations or judicial proceedings. Investigative journalists have this key role to inform the public about what is going on and the public has a right to know what is going on. So they are working to exercise that right. So that's the key link between any form of journalism and the citizens. The work of the judiciary and the work of other institutions should, of course, follow this entire process. As Leila noticed well, today we have countless informers, those who share information, but I wouldn't call them media or media outlets, or I wouldn't say that in all the media we have journalism, because journalism is contrary to what we've mentioned in the beginning, sensationalism, the race for likes and clicks. Journalism is always the pursuit of truth, because the public has the right to truth, and it is not the job of investigative reporters to institute court proceedings as a result of their work. They, they should be the consequence of you know, certain facts and information, and they should be instituted once there is sufficient number of evidence. But the point of journalism is something else, and that is to exercise the right of the public to information, to, be, to know what is going on in, in the society, primarily processes that directly impact the society or directly spend the resources, either financial or uh, uh, other types of resources. So when it comes to the judiciary, of the 80 courts in Bosnia and Herzegovina, only seven courts have their public relations officers. Well, in context of investigative reporting, that doesn't mean much. Investigative reporters are not there to, uh, you know, monitor what the public relations officers shared. In the context of daily uh, news and daily journalism, it's important because the transparency of the work of these institutions is reduced unless you have a person who is your direct contact on a daily basis and who shares information with you. What is additionally concerning to me, and with all due respect to PR services and officers in uh, the institutions, in many of these institutions, these services, in fact, are used to conceal information or to make it difficult for you to get information. Much more they do that part of the job than actually serve transparency. And People who are dealing with investigative uh, reporting know how uh, problematic is the implementation of the law on free access to information, how many obstructions are there in the path of reaching certain information or data. So definitely we need a bigger culture of institutional transparency. You know, the formal existence of a PR or PR service is not sufficient. Of course, there are institutions and there are individuals uh, who do this really well. But unfortunately, it seems to me that some of these PRs do not serve their purpose. So, facts, not assumptions. And once you stated that the law on free access to information is full of deficiencies, how would you comment on this? The law on free access to information is faulty. But what I'm concerned with is the tendencies to fully undermine this law. And we see these tendencies uh, over the last seven or eight years, or the intentions of institutions 
to further narrow this law so to further disable access to information this is very concerning tendency i do agree with professor turcilo when it comes to PR services, at the point of a PR service is to share information and primarily a positive information about the institution it represents. You know, to expect from the court PR services or prosecutor's offices PR services to contribute to an investigation is a faulty thesis in itself. There are good examples. Unfortunately, there are more bad examples, but if you dwell into this i mean you cannot expect them to give you information you will follow other traces or other services or departments within the institution so we will look for other types of information and other sources of information sorry to interrupt you to what extent does this system that you just mentioned help corruption what do you mean so when, when you said there is you know the lack of communication that we are looking for as investigative journalists they serve something else not journalism itself so such behavior of the other side to what extent it uh, it affects our investigative work well it definitely the, the access to information is something that creates problems for us in the judiciary we talk about that part of the system there is a problem with the lack of information inaccessibility of information making information anonymous so you have anonymized information i mean you, you cannot know who they are about we've had cases of final judgments confirmed indictments very often with anonymized names even in war crimes cases you have anonymized judgments and anonymized indictments it's absurd in today's world you have disciplinary proceedings that are also being anonymized so you cannot reach the essence the substantial part of information needed for your uh, investigative reporting and they're protecting data for the reason that they only know and this is wrong A pr service as such should improve its work there have been interventions in the direction of establishing the so-called media judge the person who is professionally capacitated and is serving a judicial office and who can explain all the procedures uh, in the interest of the public but at the same time can communicate with the public with the audience not the journalists journalists are only a medium for the public to communicate with the system and this includes judiciary so this is why it's important that the judiciary understand that the information they share towards the public is this it's in fact information for the citizens and the media just transmit the information respecting professional standards investigative journalists go deeper into the topic disclose information that we do not find in the public sphere and further share them with citizens for the citizens to understand the processes better we have to overcome the intellectualized approach where communication with the public always happens under the assumption that the public is well knowledgeable about the process it very often happens in the journalism you know journalists communicate with the public assuming that they are equal knowledge wise in the process that the public knows the procedure or the problem and you just transmit the information to the public that you know they have to upgrade themselves it's a faulty approach we need to address the public as investigative journalists, my organization that I represent here, but also the entire professional journalist communities and all other professionals that communicate with the citizens must have in mind that the citizens might not know what they're talking about. The citizens don't need to know in some cases. Yes, yes. Well, it's problematic to say that they do not need to know, but we cannot assume that they know what we're talking about. We have to adjust the content of them to explain it depends on the media of course either your viewers or readers to 
make an introduction to the topic, to explain why the topic is relevant, and only then tackle the new information in daily journalism, or if we talk about reporting, uh, investigative reporting, we have to assume when we share information that it's the first time they're reading about such thing. For them to be able to respond, react, they must have available the entire explanation, the entire set of information for them to have the or to take this information in an educational manner or to to enable them to respond adequately only that serves the democratic community and i hope we all strive for such a community exactly we're are expecting your questions your comments when it comes to investigative journalism sensationalism mr vukovic we'll go back to um 2015 theft of the uh, bank of Republika Srpska, the story that was awarded in 2016, not by the award of Bosnia and Herzegovina, but award presented by some other people. After that story, how many other investigative stories you did? Well, we, every couple months, we generate or produce some investigative stories. But speaking of the justice and investigative journalism, in this story where we talked about this bank, you know, um, you know, nothing happened after that story, but until today, nothing happened. Why? Well, we don't know, really, because, you know, I would go back to hold this panel, if you allow me. Expectations by journalists are sometimes too great, you know, because people do not trust institutions. And of course, if someone really does do work uh, properly, then, of course, you know, people expect that we write the story about it. And as professors said, yes, we have a professional standards that we need to abide by. We need to tell the story as it is, you know, based on facts. But if there are no other information available, then we can't really do much about it. You know, the problem of other institutions not doing their share of work is another problem. But citizens are less and less confident in the work of everyone, including journalists. Yeah, but see, we've seen actually in this footage that many citizens still do believe in investigative journalism. Maybe they do not know how to recognize the investigative stories, but it seems to me that nevertheless citizens do read, listen and monitor what the journalists do, in particular investigative journalists. Yes, I do believe they do so, but to go back about Balkan Investment Bank and the justice. In one of our stories, we proved that a, a person provided orders to the Balkan Investment Bank through the TCMS system, and no one really was held accountable for that. But since you're mentioning that story, how long did it take to you and your team to do a good quality investigative story? What are the resources needed or skills needed for investigative reporter to dive deep in order to give a birth to a particular story? Well, this really depends on the story. Sometimes you have two, three people, team of two, three people working for several months on a story. Sometimes it's only one journalist, one reporter um, doing a story for a month. This really depends on the very topic or the angle that you are really choosing. What citizens probably do not know that real information do not come for free. Fake information is free of charge. In order for us to get good investigative story that requires funds, people, pressures, you know, you struggle to uh, obtain necessary documents, interviews, interlocutors. Our job is in a way similar to the work of police investigators, only with the difference being that we don't have the powers that they have. So now we need to really find a way
dana, mjesec dana vašeg rada, ako se to svodi na, na jedan lajk like, ili na broj lajkova, onda je, onda je to najbolnije u stvari za onu osobu koja je radila informaciju, odnosno radila priču, radila na istraživanju, provela mjesec dana ili, ili pet dana ili bilo koliko provela kopajući po nekim arhivama. Dakle, nije svaka priča i nažalost mislim da se, da se moramo vratiti u stvari onoj, onoj osnovnoj tezi edukacije građana, medijskoj pismenosti koja nažalost kao i neke druge stvari u ovoj, u ovoj zemlji su postale samo fraza. Mi govorimo medijskoj pismenosti, da nikada nismo objasnili šta ona u stvari podrazumijeva. Kada se kreće sa, sa, sa tom edukacijom o medijskoj pismenosti, na koji način će se ta edukacija vršiti, šta građanima znači medijska pismenost, da bi mogli uopšte da, da uđemo u konzumaciju vijesti i informacija koje su dostupne u javnom prostoru i da bi mogli razumjeti šta u stvari podrazumijeva jednu istraživačku priču, šta iz, podrazumijeva jednu... The story is, or the news is, or what is the difference between the two, why a video is briefer or longer, or why infographics are needed. So we simply need to go back to the citizens and to explain to them, or to help them understand that consuming news or information is not a passive process this is not something that you simply refresh as a feed on your facebook to obtain some new information i mean we all know that you know we do a lot of you know refreshing or getting some feedings you know but we need to understand that someone is really investing a lot of time and effort into producing these stories you know and it's important to know what is it that they get out of such information and of course this will also help them understand the whole process you know i'll go back to the survey that we've just seen you know at the beginning of this panel you see that citizens often do not understand the notion of investigative journalism with all your respect for them it's very difficult to distinguish when you stop them and ask what is a journalist or what is investigative journalist and what is the difference so this is an alarm for us i think you know telling us that we need to do more educating people about the process and what the process entails i'll give you the floor do you think that a young person studying journalism professor tochala when they come to you to your university do they really know what they want to get out of journalism you know because now we're talking about some new generations you know they grew up with the phone displays you know they're less no, uh, familiar with some traditional media i've read somewhere that a young person in bosnia and herzegovina is um you know very good potential for investigative reporting but you know you being um, in close contact with young people what do you notice well i would say that we have seen several trends lots of students studying communicology you know so they are focused more on pr and less with um, you know journalism but i think that one of the key reason for this is a completely devolved role of journalists in our society because this is also perceived as one of the underpaid or the most underpaid professions or occupation in our society and that the risk that um, the journalists are exposed to are also considered uh, way too serious or high and that actually the work that they do and the pay you know the salaries that they are paid are not worth of the risk that they are exposed to while doing the work so people of course do not see any motivation in sort of exposing themselves to such risks because they have neither personal benefit from it or any recognition social recognition for the work that they do and the colleagues have said um you know there is a very small reaction of the general public or institutions to um, you know media stories or investigative stories so i think that this is really responsibility of all of us um, you know a society as a, as a whole because our people consider all media stories as something that they should have free of charge quick 
and you know it's something that is short term you know they don't need to really remember it so we do not distinguish between those who are just doing copy pasting status of some famous celebrity persons who are known only by their fame from those who at any cost would like to really be in the media you know being in in a, involved in some scandals and those who are seriously involved in investigative reporting and thus um, being exposed to different risks you know so i see no reason why would a young person would really fight for a position in in uh, journalism for as long as our society has a, has a, such an attitude towards journalism you know so people are really not motivated you know and i think that lack of motivation is not the you know result of their lack of um sensibility you know but it's more about the conditions in which you do the work you know our students often do um apprenticeship in center for investigative reporting and there are some brilliant young people who really want to do investigative journalism but when they go to some um, investigative reporting institutions they already come with some wrong perception of investigative journalist you know today we've started defining you know um, investigative journalism or the prejudice most frequent prejudice about them is that investigative journalists are spies people who are diving deep to bring some stories to the surface or people who are informants and people who and you know this is really rather discouraging and of course for the serious investigative journalists this takes lots of time and energy to explain that this is absolutely wrong and again i think that this is not a problem of media and it is not problem that all of them now live in digital environment because digital environment is very conducive of some beautiful investigative stories even probably more than in some conventional traditional media today the strongest investigative stories are present in the web portals but but the problem is about the perception of investigative journalism and how underestimated it is as, as, a, as an occupation and also you know this is really something that it should be uh, very much appreciated but unfortunately in our society is one of the un most underestimated uh, occupation and frankly if i were 20 now i'm not sure that i would be really motivated to go uh in this direction in the direction of the investigative journalism i apologize to our participants we had a connection interruption for a while i hope that now all this is now okay Mr. Vukilic, you wanted to say something. I just wanted to say about media literacy, you know, I think that this is uh, that we have a very low level of media literacy. I think that we need to really start from the schools, you know, so at least a couple of times a year, we need to start teaching our students about critical thinking because they are all exposed to these phones and different media. So we need to teach them actually how to distinguish texts, video, of course, parents who lived in a different system and many of them still do not understand certain journalist forms you know for example all our colleagues you know see that politicians often do not understand different uh, journalist uh, forms you know what's the difference between logo uh, column or comment or you know so if someone has presented a personal view in the newspapers, you might be sued, you know. So this really shows how ignorant people are, you know, about the work that we do. Investigative journalists are often, you know, the target of um, threats or even physical attacks. So when it comes to um, journalists, in particular investigative journalists, how the institutions such as police or prosecutors really protect these people so the question for all of you how these bodies you know protect journalists it's a difficult question really i do not i'm, I'm just trying to somehow form the answer that will not insult anyone but i would like to tell you what i think i would say they do not protect us 
This is not only a matter of violence against journalists in general, this is also a matter of reaction of police to violence of those who are not in the first echelon of the politics. Unfortunately, we see now that police primarily denies any form of protection. For example, we had many situations. Luckily, we were never exposed to physical attack directly, but we were actually exposed by lots of uh, threats, uh, lots of threats via social media. And we always reported. To whom you reported? To the police. Because this is the first step, actually, you know, in the Federation, we are talking about the Federation Ministry of Interior because they have cyber crime departments. So this is their jurisdiction. So we always report any threat that we receive. If in Republika Srpska, then there is a Ministry of the Interior in Republika Srpska. But six months later, we normally just get information that they have closed the investigation and that this is an anonymous person which they couldn't identify. And with this, the whole case is closed. We had also situations where some people would steal our identity. For example, there were people posing as SIN reporters, and they are using this identity to racketeer institutions, you know. So SIN is used as a form of intimidation. So. We reported that as well, you know, because according to the law, you know, pre pretending or false representation is a criminal offense. And again, we didn't really see any support from the police. So it is very difficult to say that we feel safe doing the work in the system of Bosnia and Herzegovina because journalists often if we if we talk about you know the story that we did in 2019 which was two years ago for the um, media freedom day which is early in early may and this was done research was done by the association of journalists beha novinare and this survey said that one quarter of the respondents said that it is fine they're fine with disciplining journalists in a way and this survey is repeated year each year and this tells us that there is an increasing trend among the general population in terms of sanctioning journalists and again you know this is really something that um is in contrast with the democratic principles you know that we are trying to to promote here so if in public broadcasters or in the media in general you hear stories that you know the highest political officials are very aggressive with uh, journalists calling them names insulting them and often physically attack them either them or their security the, the, the bodyguards and if this is not sanctioned what kind of message do you convey to public you're saying that this is acceptable and then it is quite okay and it's understandable that general population finds that it is quite okay to attack reporters you know in the street for whatever reason it could be like attack against the cameraman you know some local power officials feel that it is quite okay to destroy a camera of a, of, of a reporter or to insult them in the street, to call them names. And all this is a consequence of the general situation in the country which fosters this aggressive approach. And, you know, journalists are not immune of this. And obviously, you know, um, the police is not doing its job. Uh, what do you think? Violence against journalists, how are they being protected by the police or by the authorities whose job is to protect not only journalists but all people who are just doing their job? Well, for years the journalists have been asking the politicians to amend the criminal codes at all levels and to prescribe more severe sanctions for such incidents. We just get declarative support and that's it. Why is everything declarative when it comes to journalists? Well, they tell us, yeah, we support you, do you do your job well, we'll see. We might support this in the parliament and then nothing happens. Or they say, well, then we will have to give a special status to uh, to medical doctors and they say, yes, I mean, 
we are fighting for our profession and they tell us well and you keep writing you know maybe about certain things well there is a defamation law if you're being blackmailed i mean there is again a law so these are criminals they are not journalists same thing with medical doctors taking bribe he's not a medical doctor anymore he is a criminal offender so i mean if we catch few policemen who are you know, breaking the law what are we going to treat the police entirely as criminals no it's the individuals so we will not give up on this process but only around 25 percent of cases of attacks against journalists reach the court and even less you know and in the convicting judgment and there are many journalists who do not report the incidents to the police i've been I've been reporting, I think, I've reported four or five times. And then you have to go to the police station and you spend three or four hours days. It's it's a hassle. I mean, and many colleagues would say, I don't want to do it. Vladimir Kovacevic, for instance, in Banja Luka, two attackers have been um, arrested. One has been convicted to five years. The other is in the proceedings now. But none of the prosecutors questioned the motive of the attack. They didn't know Vladimir. So who ordered the attack? What was the motive of the attack? Why did it happen? And it is surprising that they didn't even attempt to uh, enter a plea agreement with uh, the defendants. So even when there is an end to the proceedings and when there uh, is a judgment, we don't know who ordered the attack and the sanctions are quite lenient. Mrs. Turchilo, the institutions in Bosnia and Herzegovina that should be dealing with protection uh, of citizens and investigative reporters, who are there? Well, in addition to the institutions at the state level, it is in fact all the institutions in Bosnia and Herzegovina. The competent ministries of the interior and the judicial authorities are the so-called reactive institutions. When the attack happens or when something happens that jeopardizes journalists, the Ministry of the Interior and uh, other judicial authorities take over and lead the proceedings that should end in a, a, a judgment. But that's reactive. Of course, we cannot expect that every journalist is protected by two policemen all the time to protect them from attacks. This issue of attacks on the media and especially investigative reporters is very much related to the awareness and democratic culture of the country. As uh, uh, Mrs. Bichakchit said, the citizens, the general public, think it's, it's okay to discipline journalists physically when, you know, they think fit i mean it's that is uh, that is a shocking thing i mean the citizens do not know that journalists are working in their interest their awareness is not at the satisfying level at this point the society of bosnia and herzegovina in fact is nurturing the values of violence against any person who thinks differently than them so put that in the context this also covers journalists and investigative reporters. Look at the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina, how many attacks we have against people who dare say something that's different from the, uh, from the dominant narratives imposed by the ethno-nationalist politics. I mean, journalists, people who make serious reports showing that the ethno-national narratives are in fact a cover for various types of crime, then it's expected in the society in which if you dare say anything against such narratives, you are declared traitors, uh, people dangerous for, you know, for the state, for the system and everything. Combine this with citizens having a very low level of media literacy who have been highly indoctrinated through all the processes, educational processes and all other processes in their lives, then it's quite easily accepted this story. And this is what leads to violence to anyone who they're seeing differently. And the police and the prosecutor's office will react when the situation happens. But it is up to us 
to try to deconstruct the spiral of silence. People today are afraid to speak to journalists. You, you, the colleagues can tell you from practice, People just don't want to, they refuse any interviews or discussions because they're afraid of attacks on social networks. They're afraid that they will be declared betrayers. They're afraid that their family members might be jeopardized. So in such circumstances, anything that journalists do and that has elements of investigative reporting deserves a Pulitzer because nobody is protecting them in our society. Investigative reporting in Bosnia and Herzegovina, 100 faces of uh, corruption. One of the comments and the question for you is, do investigative reporters often face censorship and auto-censorship? This is what the public wants to know. Well, the definition of an investigative reporter is that uh, they, in fact, run from auto-censorship. So this is why they do the investigation, to go deeper into the topic and to contribute to the public discourse with quality and verified information. I can tell you about my editorial room. I cannot speak of others, but hopefully, Auto-censorship is non-existent among investigative reporters. Censorship is something that is imposed by editorial rooms. So by people who are leading, you know, the, the editors. Editorial rooms shouldn't, and I can tell you for SIN, for my organization, there is no censorship. And I hope for other editorial rooms that there is no censorship. But very often in Bosnia and Herzegovina media, we see less censorship than auto-censorship. And it is not necessarily produced by fear from the editorial intervention or the media owner, because it exists. Journalists who do this work, you know, as employees, of course, depend on such uh, such pay, and it's easy to censor them. But as uh, Professor Turchula said, people just give up because they were afraid of an attack or a damage or consequences if they open certain questions. So it's a spiral of auto censorship. I will not, you know, tackle this person. Then I will not tackle that person and this topic. So you spirally go deep you know with this perceived fear that if you tackle that topic you will suffer damage and consequences and then they finally just narrow down to the minimum engagement in their work and they just transmit what other people said so he said that she said that and this it and it is completely contrary to what they should be doing Sinisha? in investigative reporting there uh, can be no censorship. But I think that people uh, mix certain terms. So we had, for instance, a month to work on a story. We have an initial trace, but we don't manage to get anything else. Uh, of course, you try to get information, you don't have enough evidence. So, I mean, you just give up. Give up because... And it is painful for journalists. I mean, you have to prepare a story that you can defend in court if it comes to the court. If you don't have evidence, confirmation, verifications, you just have to stop, you give up. That's not censorship. That's responsible journalism. So you will not tackle a person or, uh, or uh, report on that person unless you really have evidence. Auto-censorship is mostly seen in the daily journalism you have a mess of daily information and you know you have five events you pick one i mean you pick you're tired you work a lot you pick an event that might be easy or might not lead to any further consequences you will not have to explain to you know followers on social networks why you've address that topic but in this type of uh, reporting that we do it's usually uh, the work performed by people who have a lot of experience and it's it's tough work because you don't have too many sources you have to work on the text for a very long time i mean you cannot so it's difficult to to do for people who for instance just come out of the university so there is a lot of personal credibility that these 
journalists will not gamble with. They will not allow editors, you know, imposing censorship, or they will not opt for auto censorship because it's a separate part of a separate segment of, of uh, media work. This is a topic definitely that we will all keep thinking as well as people who are participating online. We are all socially responsible with our status, with our jobs, functions to address this topic and not just discuss it once in 365 days. We need to initiate such stories every day. Now, if we turn to investigative reporting in the times of the pandemic, did the pandemic produce some high quality uh, investigative reports? I mean, uh, looking at it, it seems to me that it really did. Well, the pandemic imposed the new rules of the game. We, of course, had to adjust our work to the uh, newly um, new circumstances, uh, there was a new way to access information. It was much more difficult to get information and also to get interlocutors. People were scared and we were scared and we still are scared. And there was a very legitimate reason to use as an excuse not to talk with us. So no, it was quite legitimate to say, well, due to COVID, we cannot have an interview, we cannot work with you right now. But I think that the pandemic and certain topics launched by the journalists over the last year somehow brought new hope to journalism in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We mentioned the ventilators. We've also mentioned the fact that the entire story about the ventilators started from a journalist text. And I think it was a new motivation from journalists who worked then, but also some new forces. Because we've seen some things are rolling, something is happening based on this story. When it comes to uh, the investigative reporting center, TIN, last year, we made this shift towards topics that relate to ecological issues so we were dealing um, with abuses of concessions and concession contracts abuses uh, with respect to exploitation of natural resources and there was a range of topics there usually ecological environmental topics are left to the activist citizens and it's more of an advocacy uh, type of work so small organizations are dealing with this but We've really opened this issue about the range of failures from state level down that contributes to the abuses in, in concessions and the exploitation of natural resources. And we've really revealed how much Bosnia and Herzegovina is losing in this regard. And we also work on the assets of politicians. I mean, that's one of the topics and we haven't seen much progress and we've been reporting on this for quite some time. So, you know, you have the powerful who either declare or not declare assets. And we had a situation in Canton Sarajevo that we now have a criminal investigation. In fact, criminal reports have been filed against the mayors who have not declared their assets. And we're supposed to do that in accordance with the law, which is enforced in Sarajevo Canton. Today, we received the information that Vidikovac in Sarajevo, that the mayor Abdullah Skaka publicly so in a live uh, a live uh, show he said that tin journalists are you know almost chetniks because you know of this pursuit of vidikovac and he neglected the fact that the new facility the new building will be seven times larger than the previous one and that this is the protected zone which the mayor is neglecting so we just heard today that there were the criminal investigation in that case as well. There were many stories that, irrespective of the emergency situation, did see its, their epilogue. I hope that the number of positive outcomes really will encourage and is encouraging other forces. Sinisha and I, we always, of course, take our positions and it definitely motivated us continue working but i 
hope that these outcomes encourage the young forces, the new forces to join this work. What we did, we monitored the, the public spending. So what we do is we uh, have financial tracking uh, and abuses in this respect. And what we've noticed is that irrespective of the fact that we had the pandemic and that all levels of government and uh, the enterprises were lamenting that they don't have money, that economy stopped, but that did not stop them from procuring new vehicles. In the Republika Srpska, four or five million Okay, and was invested in this uh, publicly owned hotel with crystal glasses and and uh, and then you you have different spending you know everything is expensive we cannot pay and then we see you know different general managers ordering and a new furniture new desks i mean they're used to spending i sometimes uh, compare this to wartime profiteering you know, they use the situation to either earn profit or to make life more comfortable, irrespective of the fact that people are dying. They spend money without any feeling. So this recklessness and I mean, it might be a few thousand km, but it's useless. It's pointless to spend money in times when your budgets are cut in half and you spend money on things that are not necessary, you know even after so many years of, the, of being a journalist, I still get shocked with these types of behaviors of people once you put them on public functions. Professor Turcilo, you uh, deal with the media and you in research the media space in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but abroad as well. Before the end of this panel, let us hear from you. What is the taste of the audience in Bosnia and Herzegovina? What does the audience want here everything is a sensation now we do not have time to you know read the entire text to really analyze what someone uh, said you know headlines and all other uh, other texts that we see i mean do we see quality re investigative reporting here well all the studies show that the audience has a tendency to consume simpler forms of media products or the audience wants simple content that's entertaining but we have a structural fault in our social understanding of journalism that is not something that should be a leading factor for serious journalism especially investigative uh, reporting. If someone wants a scandal about a currently popular person, that does not mean that it is the job of journalism, especially investigative reporting, to, you know, feed them with this. And the media do have this educational function, orientation function, as we've said in the beginning. The fact that the audience wants something and we're indulging the audience is what journalism should not do and should not be very often when i try to explain to my students what their role will be in the future i always share the story that all kids like candy but the parents will not feed them candy 24 hours a day so we as a journalist should not indulge these hungers or these needs of the audience also we should not underestimate our audience and generalize and say that the audience does not understand and that the journalists are the super interpreters of the reality i think that we really need to have a realistic look at to who our audience is and to join the discussion on the pandemic i think that the pandemic brought a key change which i believe or want to believe replicated on our citizens as well and that is that in the pandemic times we've seen that corruption kills directly as mr vukilic said we've seen this in wartime but now it really became crystal clear that if we don't have people who will investigate how our money is being spent on things that are not the priority and how they fail to use the mechanisms to facilitate these times to us i mean we've learned that it is the task of investigative reporting to reveal these things and us the responsible citizens 
these days we have the entire world starting the vaccination process, we still have a very nonchalant attitude of our uh, authorities towards us because we, I mean, we are just there, the subordinates. And the key task of all the journalists and of all of us as citizens should be boycott of everything until we get the answer to the question, when will we get vaccines? You know, these headlines, they ordered, they discussed, they negotiated, you know, the different press services from different services are giving us this very empty information about discussions on peripheral topics, you know, at all levels used to conceal the fact that they're not doing the key thing nowadays and that's procuring vaccines for the citizens so they are complicit in the black statistics that we see and we need to be aware of that as the audience but as journalists as well the media and journalists were not assisted in the pandemic by either the institution that locked down i mean you know, the, the, these crises uh, uh, stops, in fact, just stopped, they closed. The press conferences will be closed. We cannot have press conferences due to pandemics. I mean, send us your questions and we will send the answers back. And then we've seen the media outlets uh, dismissing persons who have been working for years you know, seriously working and they recruited new stuff to just copy paste certain releases. And we've seen the apathy of the citizens, but what we've seen is that corruption kills directly. The failure to act kills directly. And this should be uh, an alarm for all of us to really raise our awareness. The institutions and the people in the institutions should be made aware of this. So what we are left with is to rely on professional journalists. And there are such journalists and citizens who use their head to think, and there are such citizens in this country. We might, you know, it not, might not be the majority in either category, but without having this alliance between the two, we will be left to the will of these individuals that are in government, that are dealing with peripheral topics and not doing their job in the pandemic. Well, I'm sure that journalists will be on the priority list that for vaccination once we get the vaccines, ultimately. But obviously, the journalists are not respected, at least not by the, you know, high officials. But in the end, I really wanted to say a few words about financing, about funding. Unfortunately, today is everything about money. To what extent does the BIH fund the work of investigative journalists? Not at all. Sinisha? How much, the, how much the state allocates in its budget for the work of investigative uh, journalism? They indeed allocate, uh, you know, funding to finance the fight against journalism, you know. So this is a classical example of corruption, I would say. Yes, it is, you know, because you have very intransparent or non-transparent allocation of the budgetary funds without any criteria. And we've been reporting on this for years. There are There is a lack of mechanisms to control the spending of this money, you know. So all that is corruption indeed. And someone does it, very well and for their own benefit, you know, and who's that? Those in power, because all this is actually for the purpose of the politics, you know, we are a partocracy, you know, this country is run by the uh, leaders of political parties, they are controlling all segments of society, including media. 10 or 15 years ago, there were some speculations about some media being part of certain political parties. But today, this is publicly declared. Yes, this particular media is in the service of this and that political party. So, of course, we know which media is actually directly linked to political party by the means of ownership. But there are a lot of media whose ownership is not transparent, 
but they are affiliated with certain political parties because there is an economic link or they are linked through ownership or through some business interests among the owners or there are those who are controlled by a marketing business meaning you know the the small amount of money because unfortunately this marketing uh, allocations are smaller and smaller but it this funding is used to control the media or not to report on the particular stories a few years ago we did a story about bih telecom and we wrote about the ways how bih is controlled by political parties one of the uh, media here made a story and received a threat, very open threat, from the marketing service of the BIH Telecom. And the threat was that if they continue to publish stories of that kind, they can forget about the marketing support. And we all know that BIH Tele Beha the Beha Telecom is one of the biggest uh, marketing uh, clients. And of course, you know, if you threaten someone that they that you will deprive them of the you know business, then of course, you know, this is very effective. Strategy of the EU for 2020-2025 is gender equality, you know. So there is another strategy which is about freedom of media and freedom of, of public information and freedom of uh, investigative journalism. So now we have Bosnia and Herzegovina aspiring seeking to become member of the European family. But on the other hand, we have this state of play. So Europe recognizes the work of the investigative journalists in Bosnia and Herzegovina and in the region, and they support their work. But yes, yes. But that is not the only area where we have such a paradox. Russia, for example, by any definition, I'm just using this by an example because I think it's a good example to illustrate the, the situation. You know, in Russia, which is autocracy, autocracy, they have Novaya Gazette, which employs journalists who openly criticize government. But Novaya Gazette has never been closed down because this is a way to give appearance of freedom because whenever someone accuses Putin of not really giving freedom to journalists, they say like, no, no, look at Novaya Gazette. They're still there. They're criticizing, you know, the government. So we could actually fake it. We can fake freedom. We can be very declarative, you know, because we are declarative in supporting the European integration, but we haven't really made any step towards European Euro Union. And we are really trying to persuade Europe that they are making us with the wrong requirements. You know, so of course, it's the same about the freedom of media. Look at the statements. On declarative level, they all support the freedom of media, but not the media that criticize that particular political party, not the government, because of course, at different level of government, we have different political parties. And all of them are against freedom of media and freedom of, of uh, open reporting. Speaking of the funds and financing. I mean, we know that investigative journalism is, is expensive and the life living is expensive. Well, I think that there should be a fund for investigative projects, but who shall establish this fund? No, money is there. And each year, the surplus of several million km is actually brought back to the company because this is actually um, you know, money collected from the fee collected uh, from the, you know, citizens, you know. And imagine how many good investigative stories we could develop with that money, you know. So, of course, people who are currently working in the mainstream media, which uh, are exposed to censorship, they would probably, you know, leave such companies and they would join the investigative journalism agencies, you know. But I think that, yes, that's the way, you know, and of course, we understand that, of course, they wouldn't really give this money to the investigative journalism, you know, but they would give it to some media that are really serving to promote them or to create noise that will somehow 
suffocate the investigative stories, you know. So this is very simple. They do not like us. We, we speak about standards and requirements of the European Union. None of that is complied with. And I think that I think it doesn't take much, either effort or money, to do a good job in the media sector, you know, so, but there is simply no political will to do so. We have three more minutes, you know, and Professor Tocello, do you think that we have inspired the dialogue about journalism and investigative journalists? Do you think that we have now uh, steered this discussion in favor of m m journalism? I hope that we have, but again, I'm afraid that we are again having a dialogue among those who think the same or who think alike. But what is important is, is that this dialogue be transferred to real life to, in first place, I'm referring to our citizens because all of us, in particular us from the education sector, uh, we need to really draw public attention and to explain to the general public that the money in the budget is their own money and the journalists are entitled to part of their money in order to do their job properly and the journalists are there to be ha to uh, keep a close eye on their own behalf on behalf of the general public and to report on the whereabouts in the different sectors you know Okay, well, obviously, um, you know, there are no many investigative journalists, but there are some. Yes, they are here, and investigative journalists do not have to be many. It is enough to have a certain number of investigative journalists who will simply build upon of the work of the other journalists. I wish that in addition to the daily journalism or, you know, press releases, that we could see more journalists who are really truly dedicated to journalists you know people who will open some t you know new topics because nowadays the the, the pre prevalent uh, topics are about the politics you know so citizens are really fed up with these topics but there are so many other topics that could be covered and these uh, stories could be developed based on the existing statistics and this can really be very informative about, um, you know, different phenomena in the society, about the economics, about the possibilities after all. I'm not really using the term positive stories, but I'm here talking about actually data journalism, which I think is definitely a niche which is yet to be exploited. I think that investigative journalists will survive despite all the threats. Yes, we are threatened by the social media because they are taking a great deal of our funding in general, globally. But I think that journalism will always be there. I mean, we all have phones, of course, you know, we have watches, but you know, you know, with mobile phones with telling us the time, but we people still wear watches, you know, so it's not really redundant. So, okay. Okay, bankruptcy is not the end. Maybe it's only the new beginning. Well, I would like to thank you for this very good dialogue. Thank you. I'd like to thank all the participants, you know, and the next panel will be at 12.45 and the panel will be talking about the election process between the ethics and interests. The moderator will be a colleague, Adnan Rondic. Think about journalists, think about investigative stories, be de detailed and be responsible. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a good day. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests and friends, good afternoon and welcome to the third panel of our hopefully successful conference organized by NDI and entitled 100 Faces of Corruption. On the electoral processes in the Western Balkans, we will be discussing in this panel, we will discuss uh, the role of the NGO sector, we will discuss the electoral processes, but before we start, let us see together the introduction to this discussion.
Izbori, festival demokracije ili način manipulacije. Šta karakterizira izbore u našem dijelu svijeta? Kako je ponašanje svih zainteresiranih aktera u izbornim procesima? Kako je povjerenje građana u proces biranja njihovih predstavnika? Zim na glasanje, znam kakva je politika oko takvih stvari. Smatram da je bio krađi, da to treba na neki način spriječiti. Pa da ti kažem, to je sve bila pretezna montaža. Trebalo bi se povećati broj zasigurno i posmatrača na izbornim mjestima, da to sve bude uravnoteženo i dosta bolje i da ne budu baš posmatrači privržen političkim strankama, da to bude dosta objektivnije. Da je ista stvar, nema promjena. Način pripreme i samo održavanje izbora smatram da nije fair i korektno, da ima dosta nefuncionalnih stvari koje su odrađene. Ja sam bila jedan od članova posmatrača, tako da sam imala priliku vidjeti raznorazne situacije i raznorazne neke kriterijume po kojima se te situacije rješavaju. Davno je ovdje zakuhano, još se ovdje samo kuha, ništa nema, ništa novo ovdje nema. Zadovoljna, volila bi da su elektronsko, da je glasanje i da je to čisto, a ne ovako sa sto podmetanja i u tom smislu. To bi stvarno ne zanimalo. Priprema je dobra, ali je bilo i zlo upotreba. Glasao jesam, ali iskreno ne mislim da iko može napraviti neko površanje, rješenje u mojeg radu. Koji god što dođu, i ovi novi što obećaju, što su skeptična sam. I nekad se uvale, prosto ne izrazu, kad uđu. Išla sam na izbore, ali ne znam šta vam rekla, pravo. Nemojte me o izborima, molim vas, mislim sam da je nešto drugo. Au. A to uvijek ispane kako oni hoće izgleda, narodni koji ne sluša, to je uvijek poznato. Siguran sam kad vidim ove neke rezultate nakon izbora, neke neobične stvari, ipak vjerujem da bi se to moglo malo bolje, da bi se moglo popraviti. Izbori, menjati vlast i tražiti od vlasti da radi svoj posao, odnosno ono za što je plaćan. Uopšte nisam nikad razmišljala o tome ko je odgovoran, ko nije odgovoran za ispravnost ili neispravnost. To je što je. Da li se tu prave neke razne kombinacije, da li se prave razne nepravilnosti, mi možemo samo da nagađamo. Možemo da sumnjamo, ali još nikad nije zvanično dokazano da je neko pokrao izbore i da su izbori lažirani. Da se to dešava, vjerovatno se dešava. U kojem obimu, to je sad pitanje za neke druge, nije za mene, ali uglavnom sumnje uvijek postoji. Ako čutimo i ne izlazimo, onda ne može ništa ovako, bar se čuje glas naroda. Kako mijenjati ambijent u kojem se izbori održavaju? Kako osnažiti kontrolne mehanizme izbornih procesa? Kako ih činiti sve više festivalom demokracije i sve manje načinom manipulacije? Evo da, čuli smo što. Well, we've heard what the citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina have to say. There were some very interesting answers, and I'm sure we will refer to some of them during the discussion. Today, uh, we have a number of guests in Sarajevo, Željko Bakalar, the president of the Central Election Commission of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Jelena tanasković michanovic from the Podlupom Coalition. In Serbia, Pavle Dimitrijević from CRTA in Croatia, Oriana Ivković on behalf of GONG and from Montenegro, we should have Zlatko Vujović from Enemo. Mr. Bakalar, let me start with you. You know, to say it simply, everyone has something to say about your work. Politicians, primarily, uh, the key actors of the election process. So it would be interesting to, uh, to hear your perspective. 
about the period of the most recent uh, municipal elections and the elections in Mostar, so for the first time after 12 years, in the city in Herzegovina, the citizens had the opportunity to elect their representatives and the repeated elections in Doboj and Srebrenica. Yes, you are right. Depending on the situation and depending on the uh, election electoral units, the central elections commissions, but also the local elections commissions are not to the taste of many, especially those political actors and the political subjects that are not happy with the results of the elections. In some situations, that might be justified, their dissatisfaction. However, when these political actors cannot prove that we've had any irregularities, the Central Election Commission, in its composition that I am presiding over, really did make certain progress or steps forward compared to previous election cycles. Of course, we cannot be fully satisfied, but you know, with a number of examples uh, in the actions and uh, and the decisions of the Central Election Commissions, and based primarily from information from observers, complaints from political subjects, and very often uh, through anonymous reports that we decided to treat as relevant information, we acted ex officio especially, I'm referring her to the Mostar case. And I think that we've managed to demonstrate readiness and decisiveness to tackle at least what the citizens were pointing to uh, and to resist certain uh, things and try to introduce this new approach and new energy to attempt to at least partly restore the trust. When you say new approach, new energy, it's, there is an impression uh, in the public, and I believe it's truthful, that the relationships between members of the Central Election Commission is fair, that you cooperate well. Maybe this is the best composition so far. Well, let me tell you, we are all people I mean, we were appointed uh, for this position, so we were a people of professional and personal integrity. The extent to which others will be satisfied with our work depends much on the electoral units and is related to the results of the elections. Even when we disagree, we opted for a transparent approach. And finally, we have the, the sessions of the Central Elections Commission where every member can openly share the opinion, the interpretation of the law, the interpretation of the decision on a case-by-case -case basis. And I would say that under very difficult circumstances, we've managed to make these elections happen. And these circumstances do not only relate to the pandemic. The pandemic is an additional moment in this electoral cycle. As you all know, we've had the delays in the budget. The organization of elections lasts usually for eight to nine months. We needed to organize elections in the pandemic circumstances in a very short period of time three or four months since we've actually received the money to do so. So we have three or four months to implement all the actions that are usually implemented is twice the longer time. So in addition to that, there were very clear institutional obstructions and constant political attacks because of the dissatisfaction of a part of political actors with the composition of the new part of the membership of the Central election, Elections Commissions. We will talk about obstructions and political pressure. But I need to ask uh, Mrs. Michanovic how happy you are with the work of the Central Elections Commission. You are a non-governmental organization, and your scope of work it, with respect to elections is quite broad. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, 
welcome to all uh, the participants, especially our uh, friends from abroad. Well, my organization gathers, in fact, a number of civil society organizations that deal with uh, um, elections monitoring. And we've been in this process since 2014. And then we had the opportunity to monitor the work of the Central Elections Commission and the organization of the elections and all the activities and all the competences uh, of the Central Election Commission. So I personally have to say that in this last electoral cycle, we can be happy with many aspects of the work, primarily the increase of transparency of the Central Elections Commission that started before the pandemic itself, when the sessions were um, published or were posted on the YouTube channel. It made our life easier, but also it made it available, you know, the sessions were available to the public. And what we were especially encouraged by and motivated by is the fact that perhaps for the first time, certain irregularities that we have been warning about for years, that we have been reporting for years, this time resulted in sanctions. Sanctions for the political campaigns on uh, networks before they were allowed. And we we kept reporting that for years. So this time we really seen sanction, sanctions for such behavior. Also this time the Central Elections Commission contacted us asking us to provide them or data and information that we had in our possession. So we were recognized in fact by them as a stakeholder, as a resource that is there to contribute as much as possible to fair and free elections in this country. So definitely in that respect, we did feel improvement in the work of the Central Elections Commission. Yelena, let me ask you, when you define what you do in the context of 100 faces of corruption, how would you define it? How, how would give us a definition? So what you do plus the title of this conference, you know, 100 faces of corruption, that's important. Absolutely. The elections process is one of the faces of corruption. I'm not referring here the administration, the elections administration itself, but what I mean is that corruption, it really is a cancer of this society. And the society in which we live has been deeply captured by corruption. We are becoming the very definition of a captured state. This is being done by the political actors, political parties, those who are ruling now. Now we enter a terrain that is not very welcome because I'm generalizing, but our electoral process has been politicized in almost all its segments. And very often, the very integrity of the process is protected by individuals in the system who refuse or find the strength to proceed with the protection and resist the political pressures that I'm sure they're exposed to every day. So certainly, we can view the election system through that prism. And if we think of the consequences of the electoral process, if you have rigged or non-transparent elections, you come to the, to the government that is, you know, on paper legitimate, but further legitimizes corruption. Very often we hear rigged, stolen elections. What does that mean? How do we do define this? Well, don't misunderstand me. I, uh, when I say stolen, rigged elections, I don't mean these elections now, but in general, when you 
look at the entire picture. Our elections are not the best or the worst, regionally or globally. There are good sides, there are good foundations, and there are abuses. Our electoral law is quite good. There are certain deficiencies that should be improved, but this law, as it stands now, if it was fully respected and implemented, then my coalition probably did not, does not need to exist. And we're talking about the abuses here, the observers, the uh, electoral administration and other political subjects, in fact, need to prove these abuses. I mean, when the elections are stolen or rigged, and I hope you don't misunderstand me, but I have a very specific example with the repeated elections in Doboy. You know, the repeated elections have shown that certain political subjects have 10 or 15,000 votes less than in the first cycle. Mr. Bakalar, is that the result of, you know, rigged, stolen elections or the result of the percentage of uh, um, the number of people who voted. So, I mean, what could be the key factor for this drastic reduction uh, in the number of votes won in Doboy? And I think it would be interesting to hear. If we are talking about Doboy, turnout on the paper was much bigger. But the question is whether in reality the turnout rate was indeed that high. If we are to talk about the case of Doboy and the reasons why the Central Election Commission cancelled or revoked these elections was um, the suspicion of a suspicion about the turnout rate, in particular in the early morning hours, because we have calculated based on logical indicators because it is absolutely impossible that that early in the morning we have such a large number of people turning out at a polling station and voting in five minutes. Physically, this is not possible. And also, on the other hand, uh, in Dobboy, there was a um, situation that the largest number of observers were prevented to be at the polling stations from the sixth morning in the earning until the opening of the polling stations. So what we assume, based on the uh, findings that we have from the expert witnesses, was that the largest number of election fr frauds were made in that period, from the six in the morning until the opening of the polling stations. And this is actually, Graphologue Grafolo actually established that this is where most of the frauds were made. And of course, when you apply this on a sample, because it's really impossible to do the entire um, analysis on the on the overall sample, but maybe that's why, you know, the turnout rate was that big. But maybe the turnout rate was like, you know, similar to that in the re-election process. But this result maybe shows that the winners are the same, but the way in which they won is different. Obviously, this, you know, we're speaking about the local elections, and if we now, re you know, replicate this number on the general elections, then of course, you know, we're talking about a significant number, you know, of MPs at the entity levels or at the state level. So this is definitely something that needs to be analyzed from different angles. Okay. Yelena would like to say something. Okay. Um, in addition to what Mr. Bacalar has said, maybe this was for the first time that uh, elections in Doboy have shown the true role of the observers. We, from the um, Podlupom organization, we were not faced with this problem. Central Election Commission also sent their observers and supervisors. And this indeed 
demonstrated the role and power of the observers. And I think that this does not observe, uh, that does not apply only to um, observers, general observers, but also the political party observers, because they are there to really guard the, the results of their own uh, results, the results of their own political party. Pavlo from Tsarta, welcome. In the context of the topic of today, corruption, corruption in elections. So what are the examples in Serbia that best describe the topic that we are discussing today? Well, thank you for inviting me and thank you for giving me opportunity to talk about 100 faces of corruption in the election process. What best illustrates corruption in Serbia. Of course, I can limit myself to Serbia only. There are many faces of corruption there, but one in particular, like providing humanitarian relief to those in vulnerable positions in return for their votes or granting social allowances or any other benefits that they are entitled to by law, but again, they are do offering this in return for their vote, or different types of pressures to the employees in public companies. So these are all examples that illustrate the situation which is perpetuating from one election cycle to another. So I would say that some of these hundred faces of corruption are indeed present across the region, but in particular in Serbia. Oriana Ivkovic from the organization GONG from Croatia. I'd like to hear about your experience in relationship with the politicians, representatives of political parties in the context of the job that you do. Good afternoon. I'd like to greet all the colleagues and your guests. As we are also very, we are criticizing our Central Election Commission very often, you know, but Despite all that, we do have some rapport with them, you know, even though, you know, we are, as I said, critical of their work. Um, problems in Croatia are much bigger than the uh, work of the Central Election Commission. Our colleague actually published a very important paper about, uh, the, demonstrating that parliamentary elections in our country are non-constitutional. Namely, we've analyzed seven previously, previous seven election cycles based on, and we have calculated that in the last elections, the ruling majority had a problem of winning the support in the parliament simply because they wouldn't be able to win so many seats in the parliament. What am I trying to, to say here? Namely, we have 10 electorates and according to the law, they need to have the equal number of the voters, you know, and now we have uh, deviations that are huge because of demographic changes in Croatia. So simply our elections are unconstitutional. So now we are waiting for the constitutional court to confirm this when it comes to parliamentary elections, you know, but um, the position of the court is that the elections will be declared unconstitutional only if so confirmed by the constitutional court final verdict. Okay, so let's see if Zlatko Vujovic is with us from NM Montenegro. Zlatko is with us. Rather turbulent um, political processes in Montenegro, in particular over the past couple of years, but a um, couple of months. And now the um, elections that at first sight really led to some draconian changes. So in the context of the last elections and the change that happened at your political scene, what can we say where Montenegro stands when it comes to the topic that we're discussing today? First of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to this um, panel and, of course, representatives of um, other organizations present in, in the panel. 
I have to say that when it comes to Montenegro, this uh, political change reflected on the change of the work of administration, you know, because in all uh, the region, in the entire region, the model uh, that is prevalent is pretty much the same, except for Bosnia and Herzegovina. And in our central election commissions, we actually have representatives of political parties sitting in that. But in our context, actually, in our commission, the chair has been uh, selected from among the experts, you know, but they haven't offered appropriate solution, you know, because on one hand, they did improve the work of the commission, but on the other hand, now we have a problem of the loyalty of the party representatives to their uh, parents' political parties, which are really giving privilege or giving precedence to the uh, priorities of their political parties over the work that they do in the commission for example you would say you would find someone who would say i voted for this because you know i supported this idea but my party made me vote against so now we have situation that the election administration is hostage to political parties um, so Thank you very much. Of course, I don't need to extend invitation to all of you who listen or monitor, you know, the work that we do. So Alexander Pandurovic from SDS says, repeated elections in Doboy just confirmed that in the first elections there were thousands of false voters and actually that these decisions uh, or that the elections were um, uh, framed or ridged, um, you know. So I'd like to know who can actually open the material from the 2018 elections just, ju just to check the preferential votes, because it is highly likely that at least four persons would not have been actually uh, voted or elected as MPs um, in the Parliamentary Assembly of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Well, this is not possible simply because the ballots have been destroyed. According to the uh, provision on the preservation of the documents, we were required to keep them only for a year. We talked to all prosecutors' offices across Bosnia and Herzegovina, asking them about which election material might be actually subject to some investigations. So we kept the material up until the last local elections and since there were some delays uh, namely the prosecutor's office was providing a late response and upon mediation of the international community we in a way finally we got the response in order to be able to simply empty the storage in order to ensure that we have facilities to bring in the new materials. So all the material, bags, ballots, all the appropriate material that is not related to some investigations, pending investigations, has been uh, destroyed. Because we are currently having only one storage. So in a nutshell, 2018 ball election ballots have been destroyed. I wanted to say that Mr. Pandurovic asked a question which we from Coalition Podlukom consider to be a key problem to be addressed. And this is the work of the election committees from the moment of the appointment, their training and their work at the polling stations and establishing liability for their work. So when political parties are appointing their people and obviously they are running all this process process of appointing the um, election uh, committees because they are the key people on the day then central election commission should at least try to in include the uh, liability of political parties because we feel that at least changing the way of appointing the president could bring a change, change that would ensure more professional work. 
and ultimately this would reduce the number of abuses or not only abuses but mistakes because sometimes these are really honest mistakes at the polling station so that's why we feel that we need to really introduce liability or accountability of political parties for the work that their people do in the field of course again you know this is what we should do in these non-election years this is the time when we can actually explore all different ways how to improve the process i wanted to ask a question to pavlo in the context of the survey that we have just heard from bosnia and herzegovina so it is quite obvious that people are divided into two or maybe even three groups some are aware of the control controlling mechanisms some say that they have never really thought about it so no matter how much you try to educate them and indira really did that very nicely but they all go back to the fact or to the position that it's important to go to the polling stations and vote so what's the situation in serbia how do you well, how citizens in Serbia really think about this topic that we're discussing, you know? Well, it's important to say that citizens in Serbia have less and less confidence in the institutions delivering uh, elections, and they have less and less confidence in the elections as a concept. Here we're talking about some basic uh, democratic uh, principles such as actually uh, freedom to to vote to run for the office and and to um, and the question here is whether that ballot that you fill in and put in the box is a really demonstration of the free will or this is really something that is not really their will but it is maybe result of the pressure or threat or maybe some other corruptive action so that's the problem because voters simply do not vote that the elections are okay but why do voters i mean of course i'm i know the answer but this is very good opportunity to somehow articulate this from the point of view of voters two things are important first of all from one cycle to another the atmosphere that um, you know uh, that comes with uh, with the elections is so the theory is so the fairing which really makes the voters doubt whether or not to really vote at all you know there are different ups and downs Um, and um, there are different views. Voters are kind of changing their views overnight, depending on the statements that they hear. So overall atmosphere, which is very intimidating, I would say, makes the whole process pointless, you know, and that's why people do really do not believe that these elections are fair or honest. And of course, you know, they also feel that they're choice is not that broad because obviously there are some who are not taking part in the elections you know and this is also something that we've discussed in the last elections in serbia because all of a sudden there was uh, an option boycotting the whole election process which is why certain parties decided not to take part in the elections and those who do not take part in the elections unfortunately they additionally Um, bring down the system and they try to ruin the concept of elections as such so of course when you put all these together with this intimidating atmosphere and now on top of that with a COVID-19 environment creates a very difficult picture for the voters and now they're of course rightly question whether we as a society needs elections of this kind or we should try to somehow improve these elections to make it uh you know the true democratic elections where people would go without any fear 
We will now move to Croatia. Mrs. Ivkovic, we've heard what the citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina had to say. How about the citizens in Croatia? To what extent they are aware of the difficulties that characterize the electoral processes? To what extent do they perceive corruption uh, in, with respect to elections in Croatia? Well, when it comes to the electoral rules, they are not harmonized and it is very difficult to expect from the citizens to understand the rules that not many people understand. You know, on some elections, uh, the boards can be or the committees can be uh, party led, somewhere not. So somewhere we have the sanctioning of uh, the, the violation of the electoral silence, somewhere not. So what we are now advocating for is a very uniform electoral law to somehow harmonize all these rules. The citizens keep calling us to interpret certain rules and things. Even candidates sometimes do that. With respect to corruption in elections in uh, Croatia, let me remind you of a statement by Ivo Sanader, former prime minister who uh, is uh, tried in several corruption cases, who said elections are won by one third of money on the table and two thirds of money under the table. This sentence, this statement is the illustration of the problem of the electoral process. And then we had the scandal of Femi Media that started in 2010. The Croatian judiciary in 2021 still did not pass the final judgment in one of the largest corruption scandals where the money was flowing into the HDZ where they you know they were building the funds i will remind you also of a scandal when one of uh, hadis uh, hdz officials tried to make a deal with an independent counselor uh, i don't know promising this and that and the recording of that discussion leaked into the media and he said in that recording i will pay the campaign your campaign i will cover all the costs i will cover two thousand billboards i mean this is something that was released it was leaked into the public uh, sphere uh, uskok insti instituted an investigation but somehow we've got the impression that this is something that's quite common so instead of a condemnation by the prime minister he said, well, it's not politically smart to say these things out loud. So we are witnesses to such situations and the institutions, I primarily mean here the judiciary, somehow are not giving us a judgment. We need a verdict that will confirm the corruption that exists in the elections system. Not to mention the inadequate uh, regulation of uh, the abuse of public resources, you know, the, the more of a petty corruption. I mean, we have, we also have the Euro parliamentary uh, uh, elections. So the previous uh, elections, uh, Bandic was using the money from the public budget for his posters, but he did not win the mandate and was never sanctioned. Well, the only sanction that is envisaged is, you know, not something that would actually punish him for using this public money. So we see an ever-present corruption and we lack the judicial confirmation of what is actually going on. Thank you very much. The time is really flying. So I really want to talk about how to make corruption more visible. What mechanisms can we use? But before that, let me ask Zlatko the following. Zlatko. You uh, uh, told us about the deep ideological division in the Montenegrin society that became very visible last year. So in this uh, ideological divisions, there is no space for citizens to recognize the topic of our discussion today. So, you know, in this desire for theirs or their representatives to get as many votes as possible, they take part in something that we call electoral corruption. Unfortunately, in Montenegro, this deep division, in fact, created a huge uh, lack of trust in the institutions. And very often, both 
sides have this attitude. If we don't like the result, we will not recognize it. If we like it, then it's fine, we'll confirm it. In 2016, the opposition did not want to acknowledge uh, the results and they boycotted the parliament, but they did accept the results at the local level because they won there. And the, the, the elections was held on the same day. So when we talk about the institutions that should guarantee the integrity of the electoral process, primarily the courts, again, on the one hand, we have the initiative of those who won on the elections and who think that all the institutions that are by their definition independent should be also party related to have the party people at the very uh, at the very key positions i mean there is no awareness or culture in the society that we must have institutions that will guarantee the integrity of the electoral process and we you don't have the awareness of this you either consciously or unconsciously take part in corruptive actions very often you know by chance you know people will state certain things like my colleague said about Sanader, one of our high officials said that he offered 20, that he was offered 21 million of bribe, but he didn't say who. And it's euros, 21 million euros. It's a very serious story that does not have an outcome. We come back to Sarajevo and we do have a many question. Haris Tahia is asking, given the politicization of this issue, when can we realistically expect the technical modernization of the electoral process or, and does uh, TIC have any vision as to what this modernization will entail? Yes, there is not just a vision, but also a strategy of the European Union that has been drafted, it was uh, delivered to us, we adopted it, we submitted it to the parliament, and we do um, have, through the Director for European Integration uh, Cooperation, in this respect, so our members and uh, our staff in Central Elections Commission is now working on the vision of modernization of the electoral process, both technologically but also uh, from the perspective of HR. IPA funds have significant financial resources that would be devoted to this in short term, but long term, long term 2024. What is worrying on the other hand is that seven days ago um, we've heard uh, from one of the houses of the Parliamentary Assembly that not only that there is no political will to do this, but that there is a political, a politi contrary political process to this. And so in the parliament, there are people who are unhappy with the composition of the Central Elections Commission and the application of certain policies that uh, they just decided to resist these new uh, uh, solutions and modernization. Um, Alexandra Pandurevich, she is very active, said that uh, Mrs. Michanovic uh, pointed out this well, but local administrations would again appoint their own people in uh, boards and committees. But she has an idea. I would like to know your opinion about something else, a new idea to remove fictitious candidates. Maybe members of the electoral boards should only be comprised of the parliamentary political parties and all other parties, non-parliamentary parties, would have to appoint observers. Well, I, I wasn't, um, I, I didn't think about professionalization, but just the, the appointment procedure for the president and deputy. So the solution might be that maybe these people are additionally trained during the election years. It is very difficult, I understand. I mean, people in, these people would at least be professional and with sufficient knowledge. Ideally, it would be non-partisan, but the rest of the composition would comprise representatives of other political subjects. And the intention of this composition is, in fact, for them to control each other and to monitor each other's work. With respect to 
preventing uh, these, not to say fictitious candidates, they are real candidates in fact, but they um, are candidates to trade the positions uh, at these electoral boards. I mean, there are different ideas. Some people advocate that only parliamentary parties should be there and the others should be involved uh, as observers. But there is a concern in that case. What about the small parties, especially when we talk about local elections? How will they take part in this process? Well, well, whether they will have observers, whether they will have money to pay their observers, or maybe or will they be punished and excluded from the electoral process? I'm talking about new political subjects, especially at the local level. What might be one of the solutions, and this is just an idea that I'm putting on the table, is in the same way as we have the candidates or the voters having to have residence in their unit for at least six months, we can maybe regulate that the political parties must have their branches for at least six months or maybe one year in the municipality where they're running uh, for. So in that way, maybe we could prevent these fictitious, quote unquote, movements because other, they would have to establish an office, have activities. I mean, and if you're there with your branch office, then you're a legitimate participant of the elections. I hope that the participants uh, of our panel who are not from Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, that, that they don't mind that we are very focused on the Bosnia and Herzegovina. The questions really dictate this form of discussions and I mean it's just natural to answer the questions of our participants. But I want to ask Pavle something else. Uh, the NDI uh, organized this and USAID is here. So my question is, to what extent is the support of the international factor important in this respect? And to what extent in Serbia, this type of support creates problems to people like you? Well, this support is important definitely it is also a way for having the topic of elections and the quality of electoral process in focus on the other hand support is important for a very simple reason because it, it, it just enables capacity building of observers to respond to all the challenges of the electoral process i mean the colleagues doing similar things uh, uh, as me are here and you know every time we have a new electoral process irrespect I mean regardless of how it might be similar to the previous one it, there is some new challenges some new things that we face and we need you know professional development and development of our knowledge so any program that will contribute to the quality of our observing missions are needed and are welcome on the other hand it is very important that we communicate among each other also. We cooperate in various situations, basically whenever we have the opportunity to do so. When you said how dangerous it might be, yes, especially in the eyes of one segment of political actors in Serbia, who increasingly and in a more relaxed manner are using the old classifications uh, traitors um, who are part of a global conspiracy to destroy Serbia or you know to promote national interest I mean this is something that we see in the public in public discourse and the problem also arises from the fact that various tabloids very often before the elections or during the elections abuse the fact that the observation missions and the organizations observing the elections are supported by various other organizations so now you have a, you always have the emergence of stories such as the money came to uh, i don't know destroy or rig the elections or you know to damage the ruling party i mean in media the story is quite exploited but on the ground our observers did not have any problems. To the contrary, what we've noticed is that in uh, this electoral process, 
the voters were even more willing to talk about the problems uh, during the election day, more willing than before. And it also seems that members of the electoral uh, boards at the level of the Republic are somehow used to having observers around. So our initial problems like the lack of access to information and you know, lack of uh, insight into decisions, that is a thing of the past. Of course, there is much space for improvement. It refers more to the quality of the electoral administration. Observers on the ground, in fact, do not see the immediate dangers, so to say. Mrs. Ivkovic, when we um, take a regional overview of the electoral systems uh, in the Western Balkans, I mean, what would be your experience um, or how can you, with your experience, help these countries in the Western Balkans? Because you are from a country who is a member of the European Union. Yes, we are a member of the European Union, but despite that fact, we are facing a range of problems and the need to reform our electoral legislation. Not only that, as a member of the European Union, in Croatia, we cannot apply for any calls that deal with elections. I mean, it's something that's considered a done thing here. And, you know, until Brexit and the fear of uh, the Russian meddling uh, with the elections, I mean, you see the interest in Europe with possible interference of foreign actors, I worried not for those scandals. You know, the elections would have been considered a done thing, something that's part of the democracy, and that's it. Despite the fact that we are witnesses that it's not so, we have excellent cooperation with organizations in the region, and as Latko mentioned, we are also a member of NMO. We are quick to respond, to react, when we've had the most recent presidential elections, thanks to our contacts in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Serbia, we got observers who helped us. I mean, we don't have observers any longer, you know, at this place where people vote, but we are monitoring the electoral process through different electoral administrations. The most recent parliamentary elections, in fact, uh, gave rise to a very interesting topic. We had elections in July. So how to make it possible for people who are in isolation, in quarantine, to vote? We exercised political pressure. We asked um, that the decision uh, be questioned and disputed. So we had this small victory to make it possible. There is always space for improvement, especially when you have a situation like we've had with the parliamentary elections. Mr. Vujovic, when it comes to the work of the non-governmental sector in elections, what is the perception of your citizens? What do you think about their perception? What are the subjective difficulties and what are the objective difficulties or obstacles that people who deal with electoral monitoring face? Well, um, some research in Montenegro have shown that of all subjects in the societies, um, the biggest confidence, the NGOs enjoy the biggest confidence of general public. And we see that in everything that we do. But what we also know that is that we have become targets of other political subjects and political parties, in particular when it comes to using social networks. There is a unilateral attempt of uh, destroying the confidence of general public in the uh, work of NGOs, in particular those that are observing the election uh, process. Being a partner of Facebook, we had access to certain uh, Facebook databases and we have analyzed certain networks and we have realized, you know, some interesting trends. For example, you know, there was an organized attempt 
through the use of different skills or mechanisms via Facebook, they try to augment the effects of their work and they have targeted uh, particular individuals. For example, um, all leaders of the civil sectors, in particular those leading the NGOs uh, involved in the election uh, observing process, were in particular targeted by the political parties. Yes, they do enjoy support of the foreign partners. Now we have a let's say larger number of political parties which have a very negative uh, view of the west in particular the us and the european union and now this spills over to ngos that are supported by these countries or these international organizations so very often they will call us soroshoids the um, spies or um, mercenaries, etc. It's it's sometimes unpleasant because they're really putting, you know, the target on our forehead. But, you know, some of these people were in government, you know, they would use also, you know, different instruments to attack us. But in Montenegro, we see actually some political subjects coming from Serbia, SNS from by Vucic, and now they're using media in Serbia to discredit um, you know, the organizations in Montenegro, you know, we're still not used to it, but it's becoming, you know, common practice. So we we will have to, uh, you know, adjust to it, you know. Jelena, we spoke about, you know, in preparation for, for this discussion, we discussed about some internal weaknesses, you know, internal weaknesses of the organization. Do you make mistakes in your work, you know, and how do you perceive criticism, you know, or, you know, in particular, constructive criticism. I know that you do welcome positive criticism, you know, but not only, you know, myself. I think that our organizational culture is such. We take seriously every well-intended criticism, you know, and we invest a lot of effort in assessing and evaluating our work trying to see where we can improve things or what we did wrong. And of course, whenever we are wrong, we are not really uh, bad in acknowledging that, you know. Luckily, we've never had some major mistakes, but still, what we are very proud of is that uh, we have been operating since 2014. According to one Ipsos uh, survey from 2018, we have been actually um, entrusted a lot of confidence by the general public. Of course, we feel very flattered, but now we are also challenged in maintaining this reputation. One of the biggest challenge of ours is that when it comes to perception of public or the work that we do, we try to somehow preserve this non-partisan image. Irrespective of the fact that each of us who are members of the coalition, we have our personal views, you know, or might have actually, you know, preferences in terms of, you know, the political parties, but still in our work, none of this is important because what we really care for is to protect the election or electoral willing will of the citizens, whether we like it or not. So the problem that was particularly pronounced in the last local elections was this organized party attempt to infiltrate people into our ranks we of course do proper clearance of all people that we let in but, you know, we're people, we're not perfect, and it happens that we sometimes, you know, make commissions and then Central Election Commission then tell us that maybe this person has been involved, you know, in some political party. I mean, it doesn't mean that we will exclude such people from the process. We can never know whether someone is 100% clear, but we still really invest lots of effort in preventing things from happening because this is something that can harm our credibility as non-partisan observers because if we manage if they manage to infiltrate their people into our ranks 
this is something that can really harm our reputation and our work. You know, so uh, we, as the coalition and our project manager, we have made an invitation, you know, open invitation to political parties not to do that because we will always find way to identify such people or to remove them. You know. So we have some what less than 15 minutes and we still need to render some five conclusions. So maybe Mr. Bakalar, speaking of the topic of the panel, in a short run, what do you think that we could do rather quickly, but something that will really uh, something that would yield the results that we could then upgrade in the midterm or in the long run? We, from the Central Election Commissions, we are very realistic because, um, you know, the law hasn't been changed for years and so the last one was in 2001 and since that has been amended several times, but all these amendments were made like in the last, let's say, six, six or seven years. So, yes, some of the changes did actually enable us to do the elections in Mostar after so many years. But politics is sometimes very rigid in some views, you know, and of course, you know, there is a lot of mistrust. There are very some hard views, you know, or different perceptions that are present in our political scene. But yeah, I would say that sometimes we do encounter halts, you know, some stalemates, you know, and this is clearly identified in the opinion of the European Commission, such as, um, um, you know, the, the failure to change the constitution or, you know, some other things. So, of course, we are not pleased, but we are trying to do our best and now we're trying to see how all these problems or deficiencies that we identified in the last elections could be somehow mended within the existing framework maybe by adopting some implementing regulations so there are many things of our minds you know and one of the things that we will definitely work on uh, will be amendments to our rule book on the registration of voters outside of Bosnia and Herzegovina because this is something that we've um, something that we have pointed to uh, during this election cycle and we have noted that the opportunity or this perk of allowing people outside of Bosnia and Herzegovina to really, you know, register as voters and to vote from outside of the country, even via email or sending them ballots, you know, uh, via fax or whatever, but this has been vastly abused. So we had an enormous number of registration, also enormous number of abuses. Some of those, we as the main body, of the election administration, we denied nearly 30,000 of these, um, you know, registration. But when we published the election list, you know, we have received large number of people um, reporting that their names have been fictitiously reported, that their identities have been stolen. Yes, we have shared all this information with the uh, prosecutor's office, but you know, this is a progress in relation to what we have had in the past. But again, I think that we need to make the uh, criteria for registration more stringent. And with uh, assistance of the European funds, we will try to develop an application for online registration. There are some other things that we feel that we could improve with the bylaws. And this is pretty much the course that we want to take in this non-election years in order to better prepare for the next year. Hope, pretty much convinced that by that time the election law will not be changed. Pavle, what's next? In a nutshell, in the time that is ahead of us, 
we need to work on bringing the tensions that tensions down somehow you know this um, narrative that narrative that is promoted by the um, parties the, by the ruling parties need to be somehow really cooled you know because obviously they have created this very fierce atmosphere you know and we need to somehow really try to calm all that down and in the midterm we need to work on actually adopting a uniform single election law instead of using like a whole forest of different uh, laws that are governing our process and we from CERTA worked on the drafting of such a document so this is something that is some of the next steps but again this atmosphere this ambience needs to be changed because the ambience doesn't really make the elections look like a democratic process at all Mr. Ivkovic, well, a set of my recommendations when it comes to election laws, I agree, yes, a uniform election law stipulating very clearly procedures and rules. As for the election commissions, we need to have people who are not tied to political parties, not people who maybe years earlier were MPs, you know, because, you know, they've been paid by the parties. Therefore, we need to have people who are not party related. We also need to have, um, you know, uh, election process that will be in line with our constitution because all of this really um, shadows in a way, you know, the fair and fair elections, you know, we need to reinforce the civic education for years we've been actually advocating to introduce civic education in primary and secondary schools because we feel that our society is in apathy it's pessimistic and we simply need to develop awareness that change cannot happen you know to change things we can't change or, you know, a government only. We need to encourage citizens to truly believe that change is possible. I apologize for interrupting, but what is the role of the media in that process? Well, media has a very important role, but I think that we need to invest not only in non-profit media, but we also need to invest into good quality investigative journalism, not to rely only on one uh, model of media. And of course, uh, civil society is indeed a key uh, stakeholder and they need to support the change. So this is something that I think is extremely important. Zlatko? In Montenegro, we now have a huge opportunity to reform election law, which is actually a precondition for our progress on the path to, towards the EU. For years, this was not possible because the, you know, the ruling party has boycotted the parliament. Now that former opposition is now in power and now they need to negotiate with the opposition about the two-third majority that is needed for this um, reformed election law. We are now trying to depoliticize the um, National Election Commission and introducing professionalism into this um, organization. And also we have developed a number of recommendations about uh, introducing preferential voting and also um, amending or democratizing uh, the process of appointing the candidates on behalf of the political party. So it, there is a really a whole set of recommendations because we have recognized that this is a big opportunity, big chance for us, and we hope that we will take it. 
but again, you know, uh, it's very important that we have support of our international organization and partners such as um, USA and the European Union. Unfortunately, we are such a small society and therefore we need to have actually strong support. Unfortunately, you know, you know, our opposition has a very strong supporter and ally in, you know, um, Russia in this case. Well, Yelena was very diligent in taking notes and let's hear your conclusions. Well, based on the conclusions from my colleagues, we could say that Bosnia and Herzegovina sometimes can be an example of good practice. We have fairly good election law in the context of uh, organizing the elections, you know, but we do have a single election law and we also have preferential voting which is something that the other countries are struggling with but what we need to address is the abuse abuse which often remain unpunished you know so what we really see is that um, some persons committing you know electoral fraud are criminally responsible or held criminally responsible for their actions, you know. So we have seen a lot of abuses which do, do harm the confidence in the institution and undermines the system, I would say. But if we speak more specifically about the actions that maybe could yield some improvements in the short run, we could think about the way of appointing members to the um, election commissions or, or election boards. I think that it is high time for all of us to use any pressure possible to somehow introduce new form of technology into election process. Of course, this is the task for the experts because we need to see what is appropriate for our context, but we need to try to reduce the human factor or human impact in the process, you know, because, um, of course, establishing results is always a big challenge. So we really need to have the results that are true results rather than to have results that are determined by the uh, vote counters. We also need to work more on the pre-election uh, period. Pavel spoke very nicely about it because the uh, situation that he spoke about is almost identical in Bosnia and Herzegovina. There is a huge pressure on the citizens about whom they should vote for. So we really need to develop an environment, ambience, in which people will feel free to decide however they want, whether they whether, whether like it or not. Well, thank you very much. We are at the very end of this panel discussion. I would like to thank all my interlocutors. I think that we at least have detected some well-known things, but I do believe that we have also offered some solutions, feasible solutions, something that can be done in a relatively short period of time, taking into account all these circumstances, including the very complicated Bosnian structure, so, in a way, I would say that we are, you know, we are at the end of this, I hope, very successful conference titled 100 Faces of Corruption. And as a good custom would say that we need to somehow wrap up in a very good spirit. At the beginning, at 9.30, we had spoke, we heard from Nenad Simovic, director of NDI to Bosnia and Herzegovina. And now we would like to give him the opportunity to close down the session well thank you very much this was indeed very interesting to to you know follow this um, discussion unfortunately i had to travel from sarajevo you know to receive the vaccine so i wasn't able to be with you in person but life goes on you know so i deeply thank you to you and the previous panelists and moderators and i'd like to thank you all for the um, this very rich debate and your contributions to very rich debate what we have seen today is how important is to have partners in the fight against the corruption we had some mps we had journalists we had representatives of uh, election commissions civil sector so we had all those who are involved 
in the, you know, in all these processes. I think it's very important to say that uh, there has to be a strong mechanisms to protect the society against corruption, while on the other hand, we need to establish an efficient and appropriate sanctioning system, which would be resorted to when need be. But we do hope that we will continue cooperation uh, on this matter in the future. And on my part, I'd like to thank you um, all for your contribution and to wish you a pleasant rest of the day. Thank you very much.